Good evening, model railroaders, and welcome back to the second section podcast where it's just regular folks talking about model railroading. I'm your host, Andy Dorsch, and joining me this evening from the snowy studio in Green Bay, Wisconsin, is Mike Ostertag. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing great. I just got the shovel, and that's cra- it's crazy what's going on right now. Well, that's good. That's good. Um, yeah. How, I'm getting David Winther says we got a bit of feedback coming in. Is that do. still true? Do we question mark? I don't know. I don't hear nothing. Hmm. I don't either. Okay, good. Well, that was a good start to the show. We yeah, got a sure. gym. We got a gym dandy for you this evening. We have a full house on screen. We have three people waiting in the wings. Um, to to talk to us this evening about their freelance model railroads. And we got some vendors here in the house this evening. We got Christopher uh, Palmieri and Doug Watts joining us from Home Shops and Jeff Lasan from Rapido Trains. So let's welcome our vendor friends to the show. Guys, how's it going? It's going well. Oh, Great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much uh, for for. Uh, taken a, a few minutes uh, to to talk with us tonight about um, the the freelance um, I guess the freelance movement that's going on in in model railroading right now and um, I guess Chris um, this was kind of uh, one of your I guess good ideas that we wanted to get out there so what are we doing here tonight? Well, today we are doing a couple of things. We're introducing our uh, next freight car, which is the uh, Rapido B70 box car. Uh, we're doing it in eight freelance road names, and we're also going to introduce you to uh, the manufacturer and the uh, road owners. So uh, uh, you'll get to get to put a lot of faces and uh, stories behind the product we're coming out with, and, and hopefully uh, uh, we'll be as excited about the cars as I am. Oh, yeah, I know um, you you have the and and just to talk shop here for a little bit, but you have the pre-orders already out and available. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, we put them live on a website. If you go to homeshops.net, there's a pre-sale page and all eight road names of the uh, B70 boxcar are avail- available for pre-sale. And the pre-sale purchases are discounted five dollars per car, so you can get them now for forty-nine ninety-five. Um, Let me see here. So if I go to the pre-sale. Yeah, at the top, I navigate to pre-sale. Look at these beauties. Yep, and there they are. At each one of the buttons to the right uh, gives you the four uh, road numbers. Each car is available in four four road numbers. Only fifty each were made of each number, so. Uh, We've already got a, a week's worth of sales as they're they're starting to starting to people are starting to figure it out. That's awesome. And we have every one of the road owners here with us tonight in studio um, to talk about their roads as well. So this is gonna be this is gonna be fantastic. Um, and I guess to kind of kick the show off, um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to um, send it over to to Jeff. Um, from Rapido, right? I think that's how we wanted to start the show off this evening to talk sure. about essentially um, the genesis of this project and the prototype beginnings and how that kind of transfers over to the freelance world. So um, it's uh, Jeff, are you ready to go on your end? Yeah, yep. Okay, this is awesome. So I'm gonna put you up on the big on the big screen solo layout if that's cool with you. Sure. Um, and I'll hand it over to you. Take it away, Jeff. Sounds great. I'm just going to get some photos up here. Um, One moment for that. So you let me know when you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. All right, let's hit it. Are you seeing a folder or an image right now? I'm seeing a folder folder. right now. Okay, let me redo that. (laughs) Sorry. Uh, One moment. No, that's all right. So we do have over 100 folks in the section crew this evening um, out here in the chat. So fire away with your questions. David Winther um, makes a good point that these will probably be sold out by the end of the show, let's hope. So uh, life goals there. 
Let me see. I'm going to bring Jeff back onto the stage here. Welcome back, Jeff. Yeah, sorry about that. No, you're all right. I'm pretty good at filling dead air. Just ask Mike. <laughs> Our car rides are never are never boring. He has uh, he has gotten to be quite the professional at it, Jeff. In the yeah. last two years, he's gotten very good at it. <laughs> I got the face for radio. Okay, Jeff, I see something here. What are we looking at? Okay, so this is a SPB seventy seventy five box car. This okay. is the prototype that this car represents um, for all of the Home Shops custom schemes of this run. Uh, so this car was built in a couple batches for both Cotton Belt and Southern Pacific originally. Um, build dates, I believe, are between 1973 and 75. I might be off by one year. Uh, maybe it was 72 to 75. But um, these are really classic looking box cars and they were built um, in a total quantity of about 3,000. Um, this SP car was one of the, was part of the last batch um, when you hear an SP boxcar class and it's an SP B for boxcar, 70 for 70 ton capacity, and then the mm -hmm. last number 75 is just which order number it was that they grouped them in. So there was a B7069, that was the first order, B7071, that was the second order. Then they ordered some other manufacturers' boxcars, so they skipped a couple. Then B7075 is the car you're looking at right here. Um, some of the differences include the doors and the internal loading configurations. Um, some of these cars had some more stabilizing equipment on the inside to help with loads. All of them have an extended draft gear for extra end of car cushioning. And um, you'll see they're double door box cars. Um, that was great for you know loading capabilities. And in particular, these originally served a lot in lumber service out of the west mm. coast um and you can find these really incredible sh um shots from oregon in the pacific northwest where there's almost entire hundred car trains of these 70 ton box cars yeah. intermingled with a couple other groups that sp ordered but um really remarkable massive trains of lumber traffic heading down into california and definitely over over the rockies and east into the midwest and even the east coast um, so I'll, I'll flip ahead real quick to a photo we took on our diorama, um, showing oh. both an SP paint car and a cotton belt paint car. Yeah. Um, cotton belt had more of them in terms of paint wise. Um, so those were a bulk of the orders and then the SP orders were later. Uh, and you would see strings just like this, where they would be, um, continuous stretching out into some really <laughs> great, like Pacific Northwest scenery and things like that. Um, right now, I don't have a lot of photos of them in service in that time, but just to be safe on, you know, copyrights and things like that. Sure. But these photos are actually in Chicago taken the last couple months. Um, and they're pretty wild because there's just a few of these still left in service on UP. And you'll know still, this is, I mean, this is like, I think a 49 year old car in Southern Pacific paint still, um, wow. never repainted, only patched, um, and these are some of the last ones lingering. And this one's really cool because you even have the original reporting marks with the gothic lettering. Um, and that's just to say that these actually have made it all the way to present day as a prototype. Um, but in terms of other history that happened, so they went, um, if I bounce to, I think I got, a, don't have a Golden West photo, but um, mm. <laughs> we'll, we'll hover on this cotton belt one for a moment. <laughs> um, so when SP was reorganizing one of many times in the late, um, I think eighties, nineties, they started rebuilding a bunch of box cars and these were among the groups of box cars rebuilt and they did get full, go um, golden West, uh, service rebuilding with new blue paint and that paint scheme. And like, uh, I'm sure like equipment restoration and just making sure they're in good condition for shippers. Um, so a portion of this fleet was rebuilt that way. And then eventually those got faded and were repatched back to SP lettering. Um, that's another variety that's being offered. And then in terms of the freelance models, what's really interesting is these cars definitely enter the used market um, absolutely in the 90s, maybe even earlier, but there's lots of railroads that we have photos of picking them up in the 90s. 
mm. um, and onwards. So some of the real secondhand owners are CN, uh, Ontario, Northland, Northland, Arkansas, Midland, uh, and some other short lines and, and leasing companies and repatching. So there's quite a few secondhand owners in reality. And in the same way, you could imagine um, all of these modelers, railroads could have bought a group of them from SP and put them into their own service. So that's a really cool tie-in to what kind of possibilities exist with the custom runs. Um, to look a little bit at the model, this, this is um, just something that arrived in our warehouse and these photos were taken yesterday. And um, the builder to that question is Pacific Car and Foundry. And you can see some of the details here. We have wire grabs and ladders, um, the end cushioning and um, underframe details. This draft gear is pretty nice. Um, it's it's scale to the extent that you can make a functional coupler scale. Um, there's mm. this really neat extended um, uncoupling level lever that these had because of the extended draft gear. Um, in a moment here, I think I have an underframe shot. Oops, maybe it didn't make the cut. <laughs> Uh, well, we'll just cover back on the group of them. But so that's the history of the real cars. And these, like any product, they go through a couple of phases of prototyping. And then we get some samples, revise them and tweak them. And we had some tweaks from some excellent um, SP experts who know these cars in and out and all of that fleet and gave us some really great info to help make them um, really good models to bring to you all. For now, I will leave it at that. And we can move on to whoever wants to talk next. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. Jeff, I can attest to the fact that those are still in service because of the fact that in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, I just spotted one of those cars in a patched out, I can't remember what railroad. I want to say it was LRS, Laurenburg okay. Southern, something like that. It was something along those in full SP paint. Going nice. into the paper mill, it had rolls of paper in it. So they are definitely in service. And I also have seen them in uh, cotton seed service. Oh, wow. Also. Okay. So it's, uh, you know, they've definitely got a post SP life, you know, out there still. Yeah. I would say to anyone who's um, just a fan of freight cars, if you see one of these cars out there, especially in SP paint with SP lettering, um, I got a equipment register from 2022. And out of the original 3,000 on the ish, on the UP roster, as of 2022, there were only like 13. So <laughs> wow. if you see one, take a photo. <laughs> um, and again, wow. they're almost at the 50-year FRA mandate. So if, you know, depending on who owns them and things like that, other factors, but company service. But basically, like, take a picture if you see one, because they're not going to be around that much longer. Um, and... Jeff, just a, a quick question. Do you still have the um, the prototype versions available in HO scale on Rapido trains? Yes. So they actually probably are just being listed as in stock uh, because the entire shipment has just arrived in our, our warehouse and is getting um, packaged up and sent out. So um, we have it through us. You'll see it arrive in stores in the next week or two. And then, of course, home shops in the same way should have it very, very soon. Okay, very cool. And then just to, to quickly touch on, um, so you're you're also going to be up at um, Springfield um, yes. as well. Are you yourself going to be there with the Rapido crew? Yeah, I am going to be there. And we will have some samples of these cars just to look at. And it's going to be really exciting to see the custom cars at home shops table. Um, we'll also have tons of other stuff behind me. Uh, I think if I stop sharing, uh, this little <laughs> diorama behind me has um, some very fresh samples. These BART cars just came in, and they're first samples of um, BART rapid transit cars. And then behind me are a bunch of C30s because that's the project that we're closing the order books on very soon. So all yeah. kinds of stuff will be on hand for that. So that's very cool. And then and then just to segue nicely over to Chris, um, you you're gonna be are you gonna be at uh, the the big E as well in Amherst, correct? We will. We'll be in the uh, young building right next to uh MacRail. Okay, and so MacRail is gonna be hopefully joining us this evening as well, Greg and Cruz. So he's he's on the second shift tonight. So 
Um, speaking of which, um, uh, unusual to the format of this show, we are right on schedule. So, Jeff, I want to thank you for the very timely presentation. Um, and what we're going to do for you this evening is we're going to go through um, and alphabetically through the uh, road owners um, in this run from home shops. Um, so we're going to start with uh, Joe uh, Loggins from Arkansas Valley. First of all, thank you, Joe, for taking the time to hang out with us this evening. Um, and why don't you give us a, a little introduction to the Arkansas Valley, and um, we'll get into some of the pictures that you had. Okay. You I want to thank you uh, right up front for uh, pronouncing my last name correct. <laughs> Did I get um, it? Yeah, you got it. You nailed it. It's A-N-S, not I-N-S. If it yeah, was I-N-S. Yeah, I, I would prefer driving Kenny's uh, tour bus. But <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The, yeah, sing, um, the famous singer, right, from the 80s. Oh, yeah, Kenny Loggins. Um, yeah, I get a lot of questions. Are you related? No, I'm not. <laughs> oh, sure, but. oh, well, hello, everybody. My name's Joe Loggins. Uh, I live up here in the Pacific Northwest now. But uh, I started the Arkansas Valley. Uh, back in 1980, it's been going on for 43 years now. Holy smokes. Um, wow. And it's it's been a victim of circumstances all these years, or as Brian <laughs> and I were talking about earlier, a, a running gag for 43 years, uh, which I'll get into. But, um, Brian, if you just throw the C-636 up there first, if you can. And uh, let me see here. Brian spoke here is going to be running the crew here in just a second. So stand pat and I'll get that up once I see the pictures. And so I don't have the capability of doing this, but at least I can see. Yeah. Them. Yeah, we'll just take a, a take a minute here. We got there. We go. That looks like the badger. Uh, Ooh. That. I'm, I'm, I've, I've still got a you know a tin can and string. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we managed to fit you in though. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, you know you might be a redneck if you if your Bluetooth is a tin can strapped to your head with a. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, anyway, um, I started, uh, I looked out and got hired with the Illinois Central Gulf Road as a clerk uh, down in New Orleans. And shortly thereafter, I joined the uh, Crescent City Mall Roading Club. Okay. And this is my first, uh, what, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Anyway, um, example of seeing what a freelance was. Now, I I was aware of people who had names for the layouts, like uh, the Pine Tree Central or the Plywood Express, uh, or some other famous ones like Delta Lines, Ute Short Lines, etc. Right. But here was a railroad that went from point A to point B. They had timetables. They had dispatchers, switch lists, everything. I mean. They ran it like real road. Well, the way they operated was first Friday of the month was steam. Second was transition. Third was modern. Fourth was, hey, let's go for it. You know, what if, you, if you want to bring, bring your Tyco GP20 out, as long as it could run on hand-laid Code 70 rail, Dang. Uh, it, it was good to go. Well, I decided, since I live in an apartment, I knew couldn't build a layout. I decided to start my own railroad. And since I lived in Arkansas shortly while I was a kid and I loved the mountains, I wanted to create a railroad that would interchange with the Crescent Lines. And so I came up with the Arkansas Valley. I like the sound of it. Lehigh Valley, Shenandoah Valley. Yeah, I'll go with Valley. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was totally original until I found out. <clears throat> Uh, there were actually two railroads a long time ago 
uh, with the same name, Arkansas Valley. Really? Uh, yeah. That's uh, kind of cool. <laughs> one was Colorado, uh, which has the distinction of being the first railroad in the United States to go belly up. It only lasts <laughs> like five years. <laughs> and it was an offshoot of the Kansas and Pacific. The other one was the Arkansas Valley Interurban, which was in Wichita, Kansas. And it lasted until maybe the early 50s. So wasn't quite original. But I decided I wanted to come up with a paint scheme that nobody else had copied. And I saw some that were close. But no, my original paint scheme was a solid white cab with a white frame white pal pilot and the conrail blue to the back oh. yeah blue was my favorite color it eventually evolved into what you see on the screen right now but getting back to the the just of the road itself i decided to interchange with crescent lines in helena arkansas okay i, I got a line that um if uh, Brian can throw up the map now. Oh, there we go. Brian's our special guest uh, um, producer this evening, helping <laughs> us behind the scenes. Oh, uh, not that far. <laughs> <laughs> Do, well, can you zoom in at the top there, Brian? I think there's a zoom function. We're down at the bottom, maybe. There you go. Now we're looking sharp. Now, this, this is the Arkansas Valley. Uh, it's a uh, Midwest regional. Um, and it actually, from the east side, Memphis, down to Helena, over to Pine Bluff, Malvern, then Hot Springs, which is corporate headquarters. And I got to visit Hot Springs on a couple of occasions, you know, when I was younger. But from there, I had a branch going up to Little Rock, of course. And then instead of going around and following the river like the Mopac did, I decided to cut through the mountains due west and turn north to Fort Smith. Now, Fort Smith is the hub. That's where the, the shops are, the, the biggest yard, everything is there in Fort Smith. From there, I went due west to Oklahoma City. Then from Oklahoma City over to Amarillo, I more or less followed the Canadian River and that's about what it was for a while. But then I ex decided to, uh, after the a and um, yeah, after the BN sold the ex fresco line, um, I decided, eh, maybe I'll go the other way. So I cut through the hills uh, through the Mulberry Canyon, I believe. And from there, went on up to Harrison. Um, Springfield, then eventually to Kansas City. Well, the split at the top is where we connected with the old Rock Island line between St. Louis and Kansas City. But of course, this is the latest map. I also had a branch line that came off the line at Oreg. It's just a little north of well, just due north of Hot Springs, you'll see the little branch off there. Hmm. Runs, runs down to Clarksville, Arkansas, and over to Hector. It did keep going up further east out to Clinton and uh, Heber Springs, I believe it is. And But that, mm, that died off. Then after the uh, BN... Um, got rid of the uh, Frisco line uh, down south. Uh, we grabbed it so that we could get down to Paris and Dallas, Texas, uh, which we now connect with the uh, um, mm, Natchez <laughs> Trade Orient. I'll get it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our Mexico uh, traffic base now. So, yeah. Joe, it, where did this railroad interchange with the, the Crescent Lines? Okay, right now, uh, Helena. Okay. Yeah, and 
Uh, probably, no, nah, it wouldn't be Springfield. Probably Harrison as well, Harrison, Arkansas. Because when Sh Lou Schultz and I uh, worked on the uh, Crescent Lines expansion, uh, when we took it all the way to KC, um, we the Crest Lines basically took over the old Missouri in North Arkansas. Was it the Northern Arkansas? It was one of them. And so, um, uh, yeah, it'd be Helena and Harrison. Wow. That would be the two interchange points. <clears throat> So this now, is a you're I mean this is a this is a no no joke of a railroad. This is pretty pretty legit uh operation that you're mapping out here. Well, I said oh and uh and of course after the rock island went belly um uh, yeah. we grabbed the the link west of Amarillo to Tucumcari so we could have bridge freight, you know, from Tucumcari all the way to Memphis. So <laughs> predating well, Meridian Speedway a little bit. <laughs> That's cool. So, yeah. You know, chemicals, lumber, whatever we can haul, uh, it's out there. But uh, yeah. Now, let me get um, <clears throat> um, for those who might be interested. Um, I do have a Facebook page. And yes. With tons of photos from my layout. Now, my layout. Uh, is conservative. It's just a spare bedroom. I'm more of a collector now. I'm big time into bicentennials. But um, if uh, Brian, can you throw the picture of the lat? Yeah, there you go. Oh my God! Oh, no, that's a good looking train right there. <laughs> and as you can see there are roughly how many? <laughs> I've got I think fourteen now of the um, Arkansas Valley. 86 foot uh, Jesus. magic cars, auto parts. Put them all together to chase its tail. Oh, very close. <laughs> <laughs> what what portion of the layout are you modeling? Um, actually, I'm modeling uh, what you see there is uh, the West End of Hot Springs. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm modeling uh, the area between Hot Springs and Little Rock, uh, and there's about. And of course, most of the buildings and the places on my layout are named after uh, friends of mine. And sure. um, I, uh, the, the guy that owns Whistle Stop here, his name's Charlie LeCain. Just outside of the picture is LeCain Falls, just one of my <laughs> uh, waterfalls on the layout. But, um, <laughs> and oh, uh, Chris, I don't know if you can actually. I picked this one up off of eBay. If you happen to have seen it, I saw it. You saw Someone it. Someone did nice work on it. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Yeah, that's. So what, what Joe is showing you. So the the cars in that picture. Uh, we've actually done three now. Uh, Arkansas Valley cars. We yeah. did a PS forty seven fifty. We did a Tangent eighty six foot box car, and now this uh, new car that we're doing. And somebody had actually um, purchased one of the tangent cars and weathered it and sold it on eBay, and it went right back to the road owner nicely weathered, <laughs> is what he was referring to. <laughs> well, um, it kind of said there for a while, so I, yeah, I, I did that. Uh, so, the, Joe, this is, uh, this is the uh, Rapido car that we have done. The factory photo here just came in yesterday. Uh, thanks to Jeff for expediting that. So um, this is uh, this is what the the – Rapido car is going to look like and with uh, in four numbers and um, yeah so that's the that's the continuation of the lineage and Joe and I met in in New Orleans right around that 1980 time frame when uh, I was much much younger and uh, I, I I got to experience the Arkansas Valley on the Crescent Lines uh, as as I was growing up so that's kind of kind of the initial connection there that got him uh, and the Arkansas Valley represented in the first run and it's been it's just extremely popular so we're we're excited to continue with the Arkansas Valley. Yeah, very yeah, good. It, it's been a thrilling ride so far, I guarantee it. So, um, but um, now, uh, right quick, uh, before I have to cut loose, um, I want to get back to the, the 43 year old uh, running gag, or uh, if you want to call it that. 
back in 1981, a year after I joined the club, one of our founding members was the late Andy Sporandio mm. of Marble Railroad. And he came down and took some, we were having an open house and a convention. He came down, took some pictures of the layout. Oh, there it is. And that's the photograph. I still got the magazine right here. Ta -da. Hold on a sec. Hold on a second, Joe. Let me bring you up on screen so I can. That's, that's the issue right there. Uh, <laughs> April 1981. But what you just saw there was if you there uh, uh, one too many back up one more back up, back up that's the picture Andy took <laughs> <laughs> I'm famous I'm in model router yeah and it ran for a couple of old a couple of years and I made a little couple improvements I put um, barricade stripes on the nose and so forth but then all of a sudden one day, a friend of mine we were in the hobby shop he said joe i didn't know you'd put anything in mom rotor i hadn't what are you talking about well, you better go look because guess what uh now the next picture in the uh i forgot what issue was about three years later somebody did an article on how to build an sd50 and if you can look very closely Look at the second unit. It, it's a carbon. Yeah. It's practically a carbon copy of the Arkansas Valley. I went ballistic, <laughs> Andy. <laughs> you sorry. You stole my nice game. It looks oh. a lot like the Milwaukee Racine and Troy. I think that's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. I just I could not believe it. So, yeah, of course, I got a lot of ribbing, a lot of kidding about it. Got my friend, well, one of my friends said, well, instead of calling it Arkansas Valley, let's call it the Aardvark Valley. I said, oh, geez, how long am I going to have to live this down? No, of course, Ken Mason had to spread it around again. So, <laughs> mm. wow. This, this went on for several years, and but I just I just let it ride. I said, eh. I'll get my revenge one day. Well, <clears throat> uh, next picture, please. If that's uh, uh, um, it just so happened that uh, in 20, uh, when was it? Uh, nine, uh, what did I say? 90, 94. 94, yeah. We had a convention. The Nationals was here. And guess who was there? Andy. Oh, good old boy, Andy. Yeah. Walked up. I had on one of my AV hats. How you doing, Andy? Hadn't seen you in quite a few years. The look on his face was... He said, oh, no. Here we go. <laughs> well, we had a good laugh about it. About how they borrowed my paint scheme. I said, uh, sure. <laughs> borrowed. Yeah. Borrowed. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was uh, Lynn, Lynn Westcott's idea. You know, Gordon, they, they loved it. And they wanted me to, I see, uh -huh. sure they did. Well, anyway, uh, had a good laugh about it. And that was basically the end of it. About a year later, all the new Milwaukee Racing and Troy units showed up in Jinx Blue. <laughs> well, somebody got the message. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> That went on uh, for several years. But then, hey, guess what happened in 2014? Uh, uh, Cody decided he wanted to do an article on the new heritage paint schemes. Oh, and yeah. decided to do a paint scheme, heritage paint scheme, for the Milwaukee Racing in Detroit. Guess which one he picked? Well, it had to be the Arkansas Valley, right? He's looking like, yeah. And look in the photograph. There he is, right there. And, I said, <laughs> and you can see my picture on the right-hand side. Well, I said, you know, enough's enough. I, ran, <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote a letter to the editor, whoever it was at the time. 
this is what showed up. I got a half page <laughs> reply <laughs> in Bono Road. <laughs> And, I, and I'm going, yeah, this is, this is, they finally admit it. Yeah. Okay. The chick is up. The chick is up. So now, every, That's funny. every time you see a blue and white, you won't be racing in Troy, you know where it came from. Well, okay. uh, next, next picture. Now, Atlas decided to enter the picture and they did a production blue and white. Locomotive, there it is. I said, okay, this is getting really out of hand now. Well, we had the <clears throat> Nationals again uh, in 2016. And I decided to pay <clears throat> Atlas and Model River a visit. So, of course, all of the different companies then we're asking for uh, licensing fees. You know, UP and CSX. I got have our, you know, money, 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 trademark, trademark. Right. Well, I happened to pay a visit to the Atlas booth first, and Rob, uh, how you pronounce that? Lancy. Uh, I can't. He he was manning the booth, and. You can see my Arkansas Valley engine sitting on the counter. Yeah. And we just kind of, you know, talked. And he, he kind of got a uh, laugh out of this backstory. I said, well, you know, I want my my fee. You know, if you guys have to get theirs, I can too. I mean, you got my paint scheme on one of your engines. Well, <clears throat> he said, well, I got a brand new shiny penny. I said, that'll do. So he hands me a <laughs> brand new shiny thing. Oh man! So then I go around. The corner. I go to the MR booth. I walk, walk up to Cody. I said, "Cody, does this look familiar?" He said, oh no, no! <laughs> so yeah, you're Arkansas guy. Sure am. And then oh, I told man. him about what Rock. He said, don't worry about it. I do it even better. Here's a brand new dollar bill. Man, you so, came out come so out making I, money on that show. I got <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Out of Cody. So I like I said, this has been going on for so many years. And so and then the last thing, um uh when was it? Uh yeah, back in 21, they came out with a magazine on the Milwaukee Racing in Troy. And guess who's in it? Me. Hey. The Arkansas Valley is mentioned because it, there was a chapter in there where Cody painted up the blue and white unit. And yeah, I got credit for it. So it's been, it's been an ongoing... <sighs> Well, <laughs> Andy, how, how are we doing on schedule there, Andy? We're doing we're doing all right. Just uh, all right, good. Just coming into the second stop here, but that was that was really good, Joe. Um, and I, it's awesome to hear the history, and the I guess the the controversy around your railroad. <laughs> Like I said, so, well, I got to buy all it, guys. I got, like I said, I got an early morning appointment. Yeah. So I got to get out. I hate to well, leave, but. Well, Joe, thank well, you thank for your you. time. Yeah, I, thank you for coming on. I will turn this over to Brian because his Benton and Southern, uh, um, yeah. Uh, if it wasn't for the Arkansas Valley, it wouldn't be here. Uh, yeah. That is true. <laughs> That is true. <laughs> See you guys later. Take care, Joe. Joe. Thanks, Good Joe. night. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's awesome. So I guess that's a very good segue over to Brian um, and the Benton and Southern Railroad. Did you want to give uh, just a, a brief introduction? We're going to bring in Sam from the Wyoming Valley and Western here as well. Um, so... 
Brian, why don't you uh, give a small introduction and we'll go and uh, talk about your railroad and your car. I appreciate it. Hi, I'm Brian Sopke and the Bettman Southern was uh, created as a way to do something different. Uh, my whole life I modeled Pacific Northwest short lines being from uh, the Portland, Oregon area. And uh, I decided I wanted to do something different and was looking for a way to interchange with Joe's railroad because Joe and I had become good friends through the local hobby shop here in Portland. And so he asked me what I knew about the rock Island, uh, which at the time I knew it was a railroad that went bankrupt. <laughs> so after doing a little digging and research online, I was like, Oh, this could be fun. And so the Benton and Southern was born. Uh, the Benton and Southern name. I, I wanted to use my initials. Um, although I get teased a lot because it's the BS line. But hey, you know what? It's all good. It's all all model railroading's fun. Um, let me pull up my pictures here. Okay, so you have your own set of pictures about the railroad that we're going to bring up. I do. So, so let's add that to the stage. Okay. So the Benton Southern, the railroad itself, I started modeling it about six years ago. But the concept, the co in the concept, the railroad was created in the mid '70s um, when the Missouri Pacific wanted to abandon a or wanted out from a short 12-mile branch line in central Arkansas that ran between the towns of Benton and uh, Sheridan, and it was taken over by a group of shippers. Then it grew in 1980 when the Rock Island did go belly up. Um, the In the last couple of years of the Rock Island, they had operated a semi-quasi-independent uh, short line style operation with their lines from Little Rock south into Louisiana. And they nicknamed it the Little Rock. And in reality, a um, vast majority of that railroad was abandoned when the rock went out of business um there are a couple of segments that are still around today but uh, most of it is long gone um in my history instead of it going away the benton and southern decided they wanted to grow so they took over the the little rock which mm. basically ran from little rock south to winfield louisiana and a branch that went out from Benton or just south of Benton over to Butterfield or to a hot springs and Malvern where it actually ties in with the uh, Arkansas Valley. Um, let me pull the map up. It's a good looking F unit. Thank you. Um, kind of shows the system map here. There you go. Zoom in. Um, ah. So it kind of gives you a little bit of perspective on where the line ran. It went all the way down as far as Winfield. Uh, the Rock Island actually ran on trackage rights south from Winfield to Alexandria and a little bit farther than that, if I'm not mistaken. But the Benton and Southern decided they didn't need that overhead, and so they just interchanged with uh, Kansas City Southern there at Winfield. Uh, that was 1980. Uh, 1980. Uh, Two, with the whole deregulation, the Arkansas Valley was actually getting ready to, um, was looking to uh, get rid of part of their uh, um, old Clarksville or Clinton branch. And they, from Clarksville east to Hector, which is basically the end of the line, they um, had sold the line to the state of Arkansas, which contracted a short line, the Johnson County Railway, to operate it. Uh, that lasted about a year and a half. Uh, they were basically, service was poor. They weren't doing their responsibility to maintain the tracks, and the state got fed up, uh, kicked them off, and contracted with the Benton and Southern to operate the line. Uh, a year later, the AV decided to dump the rest of the Clarksville branch and um, Benton and Southern ended up buying it and also buying the East End 
back from the state. So that's now fully owned all the way from Orc all the way to the end of the line at Hector. Um, so I got a I got a quick question for you, Brian. You do sure. you did you um I guess kind of go in cahoots with Joe then on yeah. on the um, design of this railroad? Joe helped me figure out the initial portion, um, basically Little Rock South. Um, the Clarksville division ended up coming later. Um, I was, I had moved into a new home and wanted to had room for a bigger railroad. So I said, I called Joe up and I said, what would you think about me modeling a portion of the AV? And he loved the idea and it was originally planned. I was going to operate the Northern division between Fort Smith and, uh, Kansas city, uh, known mm. as their dog patch division. Okay. Uh, dog patch being, uh, from the little Abner cartoon back in the day. Oh, wow. <laughs> and okay. uh, that, That's a reference. You never thought you'd hear in this show. Wow. <laughs> no, no, that's the first time. And this, that was, that was all Joe's brainchild. Um, from there. Um, so with my railroad, I had room to model part of that. Plus I was going to model the Benton and Southern Clarksville branch. And um, the railroad, the, the layouts actually started off as a triple deck railroad and with helix, with a double helix uh, connecting the, the different levels. And oh my gosh. It is in a 13 by 17 foot room in the basement of our home. And I was okay at building bench work, but apparently I wasn't very good at building a helix because it. <laughs> ran absolutely atrociously oh no um so i got frustrated uh quickly walked away from it um decided okay let's simplify this two helixes is too much so i eliminate the the top deck you had to stand on the step stool the bottom deck you had to sit down or crouch down to see it so i decided okay let's eliminate the middle deck lower the top deck and bring up the middle of the bottom deck so I had two decks now and had a better, what do you call it? Um, eye level as far as the, you know, for access. Yeah, like a vantage point, right? And that worked a lot better. Um, I still wasn't happy with the helix. It worked, but I didn't really have a way to hide the, I was trying to have struggling with a way to hide the helix. And I was, and then I, ripped the helix out and just had two separate decks. The top deck was going to be a, just a continuous run, uh, scenic, just kind of a rail fanning layout. Sure. Um, the biggest challenge with that was I have, it had to go across the door to the room. So I had to put a, le a lift out bridge, which it worked, but I had meant I had to keep the, the door to the room closed, which is kind of hard if I'm trying to hear yeah. what's going on in the rest of the house. Sure. So, and the bottom deck was going to be a switching layout because um, I've always been really big into operations and switching. And that's always been one of the hot, you know, the stronger aspects of what I want out of the hobby. Yeah. So, last August, I finally said, screw it. I ripped the entire railroad out, literally gutted the room and Dang. started over. Um, this time I fixed a few sins that I had done, hadn't done before, uh, such as painting the, the walls around the room blue, sky blue. There you so go. Actually, yeah. Um, this is the current rough track plan the, there's been a few changes. The little peninsula right in the middle that sticks up, uh, is not there. And a couple of the tracks, as far as industry tracks, have changed a little bit. But that's the basic layout of the room. That's what the bench work occupies. Um, I've got three tracks staging yard that sits behind a removable backdrop. Um, and then the main portion. It basically models the area right around Clarksville. Yeah. What? I've got... I think five industries and it's still in a rough shape. I do, I'm just starting to do the scenery. 
Um, haven't got too much done. Um, oh, that was the Baldwin Switcher. Southern, that was the first Benton Southern locomotive. Um, so no we, before we get rolling here, uh, Brian, question in from Chris Bell. He says, Does BNS have any cool nicknames or divisions like the dog patch? <laughs> <laughs> um, We've got the Little Rock Division, or the, or the Rock Island Lines, which is yep. our southern area, and then we've got the the Clarksville or the the Hector Branch. So, yeah, cool. Nothing cool like Dog Patch Division. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, this okay. So this is a butte here. What are we What are we looking at? This is a Bowser Baldwin Vo One Thousand. Um, it. Uh, is one of two that was the the first two locomotives ever purchased for the railroad were a pair of former Southern Pacific Baldwin VO 1000s. This is one of the only one that survives. Um, the other one never made it to Benton and Southern Paint. Um, it's named for Jim Lyons, who was a longtime friend who passed away a number of years ago. Yeah, that's really cool. And the scenery, this is just a little scenery diorama, one of those Woodland Scenics diorama things that you can kind sure. of learn to build scenery on. That's what that's sitting on. Yeah. Um, we, we inherited several locomotives from the Rock Island. Uh, a handful of them were, most of them were Jeep 7s. Uh, this is one that was beautifully weathered up by um, Rob Arsenault up been uh, of weather my trains oh hashtag not sponsored all right hashtag not sponsored there we hashtag go hashtag not sponsored <laughs> all right um and i he it was originally left as a rock island unit but i went back recently and uh patched it for the benton and southern so is that under the 304 there you put the reporting marks right yes bsr correct ah nice and then one of the other ones that has actually gotten the full paint job I like yeah. that you have stuff under the letter uh, on the cab, the names. That's and I cool. decided to put names on some of the locomotives. Uh, El Dorado yeah. is uh, one of the towns on Little Rock, uh, just north of the uh, Louisiana border. Uh, big chemical town. Yeah. Kind of, reminds me, of, kind of reminds me of the Chicago Great Western paint scheme. Well, Very good. similar. Very similar. Um, this is actually. Um, the 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 Benton and so the the sorry the Baldwin was actually a MKT locomotive that I oh, remarked, sure. and it's funny that you mentioned the Chicago Great Western because this has actually started life as a Athern Chicago Great Western locomotive. <laughs> so that's, wow, <laughs> but I that's didn't a, know that. that's awesome. That's like, a cool paint scheme. I love. I mean, I like the red and black. Most of the locomotives on the Benton and Southern are four axle. However, they did get a few six axle locomotives because there is a pretty good grade coming out of Ork heading up to Clarksville. That was uh, an AV helper district. Um, and when unit grain trains east of uh, Clark headed for uh, a big elevator in Dover, which is about halfway between Hector and Clarksville, they needed some bigger power for those. So these run Damn. primarily on the grain trains. Cool. And then I created recently a newer paint scheme as if the management had changed over in the Ooh. 90s. And they went with this, we'll call it a dm &E inspired paint scheme. Oh, cool. And uh, that's... So, a, go ahead. Dan Dan Leduc's got a question. Um, what era you run this layout? Uh, there are two eras. I run mid '80s, and then I can swap out equipment and run to the you know early 2000s. Sure. So the SD40s, like the the red one that I showed before, would have been rebuilt. The and become these. They were uh, rebuilt in the 90s uh, to represent uh, the Morris Knudsen rebuilds like the Southern Pacific had. The oh, sure. 
And I think there are a couple other railroads that got them from MK as well. And then the slug is actually a former Rock Island slug. It was uh, built on the chassis of a U25B. Nice. Mm, and that's cool. an old blue box, old Atherton blue box uh, chassis. And it's an unpowered. Unpowered, okay. Yeah, so, do you, oh, there we go. Here we go. This is the section that I'm working on right now. It uh, has a grain elevator that's one of the big feed elevators uh, for Tyson Foods. Uh, that's a big chicken feed is huge in central Arkansas. And so grain elevators are a must. And I'm a covered hopper addict. So having several <laughs> hundred of them. On I, my, I am too. You know, <laughs> so I, I see a little visitor there in the left hand side of the engine or the, yes. uh, that picture. I've it, been very fortunate to purchase a few of um, Mike Confalone's Allagash locomotives from him over the years. So that's cool. That's awesome. Very, very cool. Um, so your name is Brian and you have a covered hopper problem. Let's all welcome Brian. Hi, Brian. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Hi, guys. <laughs> so, so let's uh, let's talk about the the car that uh, Home Shops is is doing for you here. Um, right. I see Chris has got that pulled up. Let me grab that. This will be the first time I've seen this. Ooh, mm. I like it. Very nice. Home run, home run. I'm thrilled. So, so this, I see this car is. Um, Basically, the AV bought a bunch of the uh, B70 boxcars uh, for lumber, basically general service. And one of the big customers on the Benton Southern is Evergreen Packaging, which uh, handles uh, fiberboard for making like drink cartons. Mm. Um, and so, being they were one of the biggest shippers on the line as part of the deal when we bought the line from arkansas valley we purchased 50 cars uh sent them to a rebuild shop for refurbishing and painting and these will be dedicated service cars dang well one of them is going to have to sneak its way up to the mascot and valley because i did pre-order one so we'll have to thank you yeah, we're going to have to figure out some sort of um, backstory on how we got that up to the north woods of Wisconsin for some odd reason. Oh, uh, so, we're shipping out. Uh, well, we're it, it can be used either to send paper pulp in or it can be oh. shipping uh, the finished product out. So, mm -hmm. so there we go. A couple opportunities. I think we just I think we just solved that uh, little pulp, mystery. Pulp bills in. Pulp bales in, yep. It, th this was a uh, this was an interesting car to develop with Brian. It's it's not a simple paint scheme at all, and a uh, little bit of a little bit of a gamble. And I think it came out just fantastic with the black ends, the yellow doors, the the logo. You know, would be just a bear to decal over ribs like this. Yeah, um, and so it it all came together. Um, uh, it's got the the black grooves in the doors for the forklifts. Every one of the cars has separate colored um, forklift grooves just to to help it step out, stand out. Mm -hmm. And um, Brian Joe mentioned Lacane. Uh, this logo here, uh, we can't see it very well in this picture, is the Lacane rail car um, um, logo uh, for the the shop that repainted it. Um, could you touch on that briefly? Sure. Uh, well, uh, Charlie. Uh, Charlie LeCain is the owner of Whistle Stop Trains. Um, I worked for him for about 11 years. I've known him probably for close to 30 years. Um, mm. But anyway, I wanted to kind of have a tip a little nod to him. So I created the LeCain Rail Car Rebuild facility in Malvern, Arkansas, which is where his family's originally from. And so we decided to put that as they were the contract shop that refurbished and repainted the, these cars. Cool. That's awesome. Well done. And then you have a Facebook group as well, if I'm not mistaken, or Facebook page, correct, Brian? I do have a Facebook page um, for the Benton Southern. 
Um, if you just search Benton Southern Railroad, it should pop right up. Um, you'll see one of the pictures of the red diesels on there. Yeah, very cool. It's also, I'll have all, just for uh, our listeners and viewers, all of the social media um, spots for all of our participants this evening can be found in the show notes below. So uh, YouTube, um, Facebook, all that good stuff, that's in the show notes. So make sure you guys are checking out our road owners this evening and, and supporting them because they put, they're posting a lot of cool content out there. So, yeah, it's awesome. And Joe, cool. uh, Joe Bohannon, yes, I agree. Whistle Stop is awesome. Again, yeah. hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag not sponsored. There you go. I love it. I love it, Brian. Well, thank you for um, for coming in and sharing this evening. Uh, I don't see, me. yeah, I don't see Greg just yet uh, in the in the in this area. So feel free to stick around um, and sure. uh, be part of the peanut gallery with us. So thanks again, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So on to the the next um, guest. Here we have Sheldon Franco. Franco. Right, Frankel, so it's pronounced, yeah. Yeah, Frankel, and you are the owner of the Quebec and New England. Correct. And you have a beautiful um, YouTube channel that I've been following for a long time, and I did not know that your railroad was not a real railroad, or was it was a, was a freelance. I thought it was a real railroad when I first stumbled across it because it was so convincing. So um, this is a really cool story. So I'll, I'll want to, uh, Sheldon, I'll uh, tip it over to you. Um, and, and why don't you talk about uh, your railroad? And um, at the end, we'll, uh, we'll talk about the car. All righty. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, it is the first time that um, I've really um, stood out in front of the layout. Uh, I've let the layout speak for itself for the most part. Um, the layout is called the Quebec and New England uh, for two reasons. Um, I'm from Montreal, Quebec originally. Um, spent half my life there and, and you know, formative years watching trains. Um, I was lucky enough to, to live close by the uh, CP line that um, ran the international trains from the States. So I was regularly watching the Conrail, well, originally Penn Central, then Conrail yeah. train, and the, the Naperville Junction, then then Delaware Hudson, and ultimately Guilford trains that would come in every day to Montreal. So I was kind of exposed to that interchange kind of activity. And when I was old enough to, to expand my rail fanning, I, I, I made my way to uh, Burlington, Vermont, and visited the Vermont Railway and St. Albans to visit the central Vermont. And so this layout really is, is a mix of all the influences uh, I've had uh, over the years. Um, it, you know, contrary to what the, some of the other modelers here have been talking about, I, I, the history is not specific. It is deliberately so. I, I call it a, a flexible history. And uh, if I can call up my photos here, just give me a second. Yeah, we'll get some photos going and i did i did just uh for all the viewers again just to reiterate uh sheldon's youtube channels in the show notes if you haven't seen it please go over there and, and like and subscribe as we all say here on youtube it's fantastic content i'm going to share screen here okay share screen i'm going to select window that's the one i want okay so Let's see if it pops okay. in here so, All right. Um, this is a map um, of the area of interest. It's it's actually an 1879 map from the Central Vermont Railway. So I say flexible because this railroad could have existed back in the steam era and just made its way along and, and became a regional road. Or it could have been uh, an alternative um, storyline for when the CV became the New England Central rather than in 1995, let's say it happened in the mid 1980s. So it's deliberately flexible because I, I, I just wanted to make sure I had, had you know, opportunity to, to, to bring in bits and pieces of all the railroads. And you can see from this map, you know, the west side of Lake Champlain is, is Delaware and Hudson. You've got the old um, Rutland and Vermont Railway. And of course you've got you know, the central Mont. And, and there are many other roads. There's the CP in New England. Uh, there's many lines that have been abandoned. The point being is that 
you know, the focus of the layout is, is interchange. And a, a good example of what it is in real life today, you see here Palmer, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. where the New England Central interchanges with the Conrail that's going east-west. It's kind of the same idea. So whether I'm modeling Palmer or Springfield, it's the, the idea being that there's uh, this this huge flow of traffic, you know, from uh, Canada down through New England, whether it's on going to Boston or New York, not as important to me. It's it's just the idea that there's this this operation that runs north south with a significant interchange. Hmm. So let me show you the first. There we go. The layout itself is um, in a 19 by 29 foot space. It looks like a question mark. Uh, and that's because of the odd shape of the house. It would, would have been nice if this piece um, in our patio was excavated, then I would have had a proper shaped uh, basement. But this is in fact um, only half of the basement. This is also the third version of the Quebec and New England, the first version which I started in 1993, 1994, um, took up the whole basement. Um, but, you know, like most of us, we, we don't get to keep our basements very long when kids come into the picture. So um, yes. the, the, the Quebec and New England 2, I'll call it, um, was built in this same space. I, I basically sliced the basement in half and created a playroom for the kids. Uh, and they're now old enough uh, not to need it, although my daughter is still using a section of it as a, as a studio. Uh, but someday, you know, maybe I'll get that space back and we'll see an extension to the Q&A. Um, so this space here, like I said, it's 19 by 29. You see there's a double track main line, right? It goes around. That's essentially the, the, the Conrail main. Um, but the Q&A is mostly at this point um, end of line of switching, right? So that you have to imagine that the q and has come south from Montreal uh, and there are, there's an oh, cool. interchange, interchange area here. There's an, what I call an upper industrial area and a lower industrial area on, on, a, on a branch that runs up into the interchange yard. Uh, so that's the focus of the operations is Conrail trains come in, they set off blocks of cars, they pick up blocks of cars, there are, 16 major industries on the layout, but they can handle upwards of 73, 74 cars on 25 tracks. So I my, I purposely didn't have, you know, the onesies and twosies. I have a few num a lower number of, of industries, but that they're railroad sized. So they look like it's, it's an appropriate for them to have a siding for, you know, three or four cars spotted there rather than a bunch of little industries where only one car sits. And so in, in building the layout, although I used a lot of Walter's products, I never built them straight according to the, the instructions. I've always kit bashed them to double or quadruple their size, right? Because I wanted it to have a look and feel of, of, uh, of a real railroad. So before I show you some photos, this is the hidden layer underneath. Oh, so, no. You see this, you have, <laughs> there's two helixes, right? One here and here, which give me the opportunity to run continuous run of the double track main for, for show. Uh, but all there are also is an east staging loop and a west staging loop. So an eastbound Conrail train comes in, does its business, goes into staging. It gets turned around automatically to come back as a train in the op opposite direction in a future operating session. I never have to restage trains, right? There, there's, a, there's four, these, these tracks are, these one particularly are like 40, 45 cars long. These are 35 to 40 cars long. So there's all the cars that I own are on the layout, all the locomotives that I own are on the layout. I don't like buying equipment to put them on a shelf. So yeah. if I buy it, I run it. But what that has meant over the years is that um, if I buy one, I got to retire one. <laughs> I've been telling <laughs> myself that, you know, the, the fleet started out as 300 cars. It's now, of course, pushing 400, um, and it's getting tight. The trains are getting a little too long. <laughs> so I either have to, um, get rid of some cars or expand the layout. Um, I'm leaning towards the latter. Um, very cool. That's so awesome. When yeah. you walk into the room here, 
Um, the first thing you see on your, I'm going to walk you through the layout. The first thing you see on your right is this. This is the upper industrial. So you can see here coming out of the tunnel portal uh, is the, the, the two track um, Conrail main. It's still in the helix here. This It's like an exposed helix. It's coming up at, at 2%. The main lines here, a uh, minimum radius is 30. Uh, I think here they're a bit wider. So 30 or 34 inches. The uh, minimum radius for any in the industrial trackage is 24, although there's very few of those. They're mostly 28. Um, so here you can see the uh, some of the major industries here. This is the, the printing house, a lot of newsprint coming in. This is a, a manufacturer that uh, takes plastic pellets and chemicals in and ships out in, in 86 foot high cubes, large volume containers. And there's a smaller um, furniture factory here taking in specialty lumber. And oh my goodness. So, um, and this, this, I, I like this idea of having this roadway that cuts across the whole peninsula. When you, when you, if you, kneel, if, if you look, you can see the, the, in the distance, the main line. That's at, there's actually the aisle in between that. So, if you position the camera right, you, you could see a train going across that bridge, and you don't realize that there's a huge gap between the two parts of the. No line. way. Yeah. And then, oh, so, and that's then, cool. Same, that's same awesome. thing. Same thing with these buildings in the background. They're up on the other side of the aisle. I, I created this this row of trees here as, as a view block along the edge of the layout for that reason. That's a really good use of perspective. That Holy is God. awesome. Yeah. So let's let's look at it from the other direction. Come on, come on, Victor's move. There we go. There we go. Uh, so turning around, looking back at the tunnel portal, um, you can see this this is the the end of the upper industrial spur. It actually cuts through the wall and and extends into my workbench, so I actually have a good nine cars of of headroom there to switch. You'll notice there's no siding up here. That's deliberate. Um, it makes the operators have to figure out how they're going to run this, either with a locomotive on either end or shoving caboose first, or doing it more than one cut. There are, you know, uh, switch points facing the opposite direction for the steel transfer <laughs> facility. And these switches here are, are trailing switches. Is that the train master up in the upper right hand corner there? Is that? Yeah, Fred Flintstone's our mascot. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Good uh, eye, Mike. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but this um, billboard, it says Coca Cola on one side and Pepsi on the other. Pepsi on the other, yeah. I didn't want to show favoritism. So depending on where you're standing in the layout, you'll see one or the other. Um, oh, that's awesome. This, Sheldon, I must say, absolutely beautiful scenery work on this layout, too. It's, oh, it's yeah. gorgeous. Gorgeous. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll take that, uh, but I have to be honest with you, it's just the first layer. I, I, now that the, lay, the layout is somewhat complete, it's, it, i got to go back and add in the details. You'll see it, it, it looks sparse in terms of fine details and weathering, things like that. So it really only has the first coat on um, I just want to talk a second about this this uh, steel translating facility. Um, if Sparky was still on the line, he'd tell you about this. It's it's actually based on a, a real building in Hamilton, Ontario. I actually was fortunate enough to have the engineering drawings, so I built it um, to scale. Except that it goes through the wall here, so I cut it off in half length. So it's it's the prototypical width. It's just three cars deep instead of six cars deep. And so I, I got, had the plans and I built it with Plastruct and, and um, Evergreen based on the actual plans. Wow. And a TARDIS. Oh, yeah, you noticed that too. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's the <laughs> oh, TARDIS. Yeah. Funny story about that. Every time my son comes home to visit, I have to look for it because he hides it because the TARDIS moves <laughs> around, right? Right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So. Next time he's over, I'm sure I'll have to look for it again. Um, so this here, uh, this, this is the newsprint facility. Uh, you'll notice there's a curve to the wall of the building. Again, yeah. deliberate. And that's based on a photo I found of a, of a newsprint house in, um, I think it was in Rhode Island. I just like the idea of a sharp curving track with loading docks on the curve. And this is this is built with, um, it's just styrofoam core. And I've, I've uh, put a layer of um, Walter's brick sheeting on it and you know trimmed up the edges yeah outstanding let's go to the next one so this is standing a little further back this building here in the middle that's the magic pan bakeries but it's two of them 
So when you put two kits together, you get four times the area, right? So you see it's quite a large building, deliberately so. So it looks like it deserves to have a rail service. So it's got three rail spots in between the two buildings. And this is another of all this kit, but I just, I pieced it together from some background kits and just made it big enough for one car spot. It's probably one of my smallest industries. Uh, the, uh, the upper industrial is reached by this grade Hence the name Upper Industrial. It looks steeper than it is because the main line is going down at 2%, and well, it's going up at 2%. So it gives you a, a perspective of that's a real steep grade. And, you know, the locomotives can't handle more than, you know, eight cars. They have to have two locomotives. You see, we keep a switcher here um, to handle the facing point moves. Sometimes both units will come back down the hill. There's also a caboose that's used for, for shoving moves. Let's move on. So coming down the hill, you see the grade comes back to, to join the same elevation as the main lines, just in time to cross the road. And these are wired up, of course, with, with sensors to uh, make all kinds of noise and flashing lights as the trains come through. Hmm. And again, here you can see the, the background where it blocks the, 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 the view across the aisle. There's a shot of the, um, the shops. Uh, it was recently rebuilt. Um, there's a video series on it um, some months ago. It was originally just uh, plain white and it sat there for many years. I was never happy with it and it was too long. So I actually shortened it so I'd have more room out front to add the sanding tower and you can just see there's the fueling stands as well. Oh yeah, cool. Even though it's shorter, it, it, it's a more interesting look to it because it has all this cool stuff in front. And I also reskinned it in Q&E colors because originally it was all white. So I, I made the building in company colors. That's really nice. Yeah, I like that. It's a nice touch. And you said that the logo was also on the transload facility. So that's a company run transload facility up in up industrial. So it's quite an assortment of locomotives here. The mainstay of, of the uh, motive power fleet are a dozen GP38s, kind of like the New England Central when it first started. Um, there are a couple of old dinosaurs, um, two GP9s still hanging around and one rebuilt GP9, um, GP10. Uh, there are three SW1500s, four MP15s, two, uh, four DCs and two MP15ACs as well. And um, you see the MP15s can, can uh, act as switches or road power. Typically the Q&E trains have four units because coming up those helixes with uh, um, 30 cars is, is, is a stretch. The Conrail trains can make it with three units because they're all six axle locomotives. Well, most of them are six axle. Yeah. There's a question here from the uh, section crew. Um, Evan Schaefer asks, uh, what's the ballast material that you use? Because I've noticed that too. It's very, yeah. very, it's awesome. Well, it's well done ballast. So Thank you. It's, yeah. it's well, all Woodland Scenics. Really? Woodland Scenics, yeah, but fine. You have to use the fine. To use yeah, the the, it doesn't look right. It's, uh, you have to use the fine. Yeah, it looks more yeah. HO scaly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, what else? Locom oh, yeah, what you don't see here are the newest locomotives acquired by the QE. Um, they're on the intermodal train with Conrail. There's a pool service train, uh, B40 8s, kind of oh. like the Suzy Q. So I was influenced by so many different New England railroads, and, and the Susquehanna is one of my favorites. And they started, they, they purchased four B40 8s. Um, and I thought, that's a cool idea. So I did the same thing, and I've got them mixed. Some of them are on freight service, but some of them are in pool service with uh, Conrail uh, Dash 8s on the intermodal run-through train that you'll see on some of my videos. Hmm. All right, let's keep moving along. So this is the east end of the uh, interchange support yard. Uh, more industries here. This is the cereals plant where all kinds of grains, flour, and occasionally liquid sugars, uh, vegetable oil come in here and they do ship out uh, cereal in um, 60 foot box and occasionally 50 foot box. This is a neat kit. Um, uh, it was made with the discontinued Walters Cornerstone series. I don't know if you remember that they had um, a set of, of packages you can buy to build your own and design your own buildings. I don't think they sell them anymore. You might find them on eBay, but it allows you to, to design your own building and put it together modularly. Kind of like DPM, uh, but I guess it didn't sell well enough because they're hard to find now. Hmm. But that's what that kit is. And I, I paired it up with some silos 
from magic pan and, and cement, but I painted them white so they're food service, food grade. Um, this is looking the other way down down the interchange support yard, uh, warehousing, three car spots, and down, so the, distance, cool. down the distance here is um, automotive uh, parts. So it's shipping out. It's taking in, in the taller building here, it's taking the coil steel in and shipping out. So this track here can hold five 60 foot box cars. I think this is this is a, um, a a model that is needing of a refresh. I did it quickly just to fill the spot, but I, I, I want to do something that looks more like this, more like the uh, you've seen models of those Chrysler plants in, in Flint. Um, I want to make it look more like a, an automobile plant. So that that's coming. Um, this is the um, what we're looking at here is, is the one of the interlockings. There's a crossover here and a connection between the Conrail and the CUNY main where the eastbound Conrail trains will lift interchange from the interchange track here and they'll also obviously drop in. So that's quite an operation to see the trains pull out, run, clear the crossovers, run back through the crossovers and through this crossover, pick up the train. It ties up the main line for quite a while when they're doing that, but that's fun of the operations. Uh, let's see. So moving a little closer, that's a close up. This area was just finished. Um, this is one of the last areas I finished on the layout. Um, for years it was sitting there and I was scratching my head. What am I going to use it for? And I thought, well, why not a maintenance facility? Yeah, why not? And yeah. I a close up shot here. I, I, some of my, when I, when I got my decals done 12 years ago from, um, highball graphics, right. I made sure to make a, a, a number of small decals, mostly for the noses of the locomotives. And I have a lot left over. And just luckily enough, they fit perfectly on, on some of these vehicles. So I, I painted them red and instantly had a, a mini fleet of, of company service vehicles. Hmm, and that's cool. This little building, the same treatment as, as, the, uh, as the shops and instantly found a use for this very small space that I, I didn't want to have it um, too busy here because when you're building and switch, there's a lot of switching going on here. So you may be hand on coupling cars here. So you have to be able to reach through. So I, I, I originally was going to put um, um, a substation there because I have the power plant across the way here, but it just, it would have been too busy. And with why, once you get the wires in, it just wouldn't work. So the actual substation um, is around the corner here. So this is the old power plant. It's out of service. If, if you can look carefully, you'll see there's an old oh, abandoned. Yeah. And it, unfortunately, when I took this picture, it was hidden by the, the cars in, uh, in the interchange track. But it's, there's, there's a, a, a decommissioned turnout here, hiding here. You can't see it. Um, and so instead of this old power plant, the wires, um, I, I, just, I just built this as well a couple of months ago. I've got the, the, the wires coming through on the high, the high tension wires coming through and they connect to the substation. Oh my goodness. This was also just built this past summer. Um, again, you can see all this on, on my YouTube channel. There's a whole series of back and forths about how I built it, mistakes I made and how many times I had to paint it because I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> finally got it to something that I liked, uh, found a little, um, container to use as an office building. Um, also a bit in the YouTube video about how to do the, um, the fencing. That's a challenge to do. I still don't have the, um, the barbed wire. I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. It's, it's not an easy thing to do and look realistic. So for now, no. I'm just leaving it. But I like the way the wires connect in to the substation. Okay. The next stage here will take to, to run a pole line or two from the substation with local power to the, um, the the roadway here and and the and the um, and the, the building right right next to it. So that's next step. Uh, again, this this spot was open for a long time. I at some point I was thinking of putting a station here, but then I thought it would block the view. I'm glad I, I I settled on this. It's it's not an active railroad thing, but it's it adds interest to the area as trains pass through. That was a good choice. Yeah. So this is a view of the. Uh, the, the the big junction. So this is where the Q and N E crosses the the the, the double track um, Conrail main. And I've always liked the idea of diamonds that weren't ninety degrees. So this is I think the twelve and a half degree diamonds. 
And, you know, it, it really looks cool when a train's coming through and it's sneaking across uh, yeah. the main line. And of course, there are crossovers because the westbound Conrail will make pickups from this end of the interchange track. So they also have to come back here and go through the crossover, make their pickups and leave. The, the other crossover is here because one of the shortcomings of the smaller space for this layout that I originally envisaged, if I can say that, uh, is I, I didn't have room for uh, a separate northern terminus or northern staging yard. So for now, um, the Quebec and New England trains, their staging is shared in the west staging yard with Conrail. The theory being that they go into the tunnel and their branch off to their home rails is somewhere beyond the layout. <laughs> uh, someday when I when I uh, gain control of, of more real estate, uh, that will change and the q and &E trains will actually come off their own main uh, from um, their own staging area. That's future. So this uh, big industry here is a sandpaper plant. So there's room for five or five odd little uh, twin bay uh, covered hoppers for delivering sand. And at the back end, uh, there's a spot for paper. Sure. So this is how I, I hid this corner here. I wrapped the building kind of around the corner and made sure to have enough trees and, and had separation between the Q&A and the Conrail mains and put enough trees in between them. So you can actually see the train going through a forest, depending on where you are. Like this is a high down view of it, but if you're at ground level looking at it, you can't see the trains. You can watch them come in and out at either end of the forest, but um, it, it gives that that illusion of, of traveling through the countryside. And this is the bridge scene. I don't have you know, a lot of room for too many mountain scenes, but I, I did want to have some bridges. And so we've got the plate girder uh, bridges for the Conrail and the through trust bridge for the Q and &E. um, Someday I'll get around to putting the, the guardrails in there. You can see those are still missing. That's on my list of to-dos. Uh, but this, all the, um, the abutments are all homemade from um, home uh, sorry, um, hardboard, hardboard. Uh, ah, nice. Like MDF. Yeah, MDF, exactly. But I, I, yeah. I found thick MDF so you get real sharp edges. So right. it came out really well, lightly stained with rust. Um, like I said, I haven't come back and, and, and weathered the layout yet, and it's missing details like that. But I had to put a little something. So if you zoom in, you can see there's a, a few a few weathering stains on it. Yeah. Nice. So let's keep going here. So the, here you can see the, the, the other portal to the other helix that goes down. Um, and this was a bit of a challenge because the, the, the backdrop is also eighth inch hardboard and it curves around. And so it's the first area I had to see it because I have to actually climb up into this area <coughs> to plant the trees up in the hillside here. I can never go back there now. So <laughs> if there are spiders living there, oh, well, um, but it, it, it looks good enough for me. The, um, what I really enjoyed doing here was all, all the, um, rock work you see here, it's all hand carved. It's all oh. basically, um, yeah, I, tr I actually went out and bought all the Woodland Scenics um, molds and tried yeah. to use them. I just, it didn't work for me. I, I, I don't know what it was, whether I wasn't using the right mix, but I said, you know what the heck with it, I'm, I'm just going to use patching plaster and went over it with um, randomly made lines with a, a, a dentist pick and then came back and, and just kept, kept at it by hand and this is all hand carved rock face. In a, and with a bit of different coloring, you can see there's there's a stream here of a different colored rock here, just subtle, but in there. Right. Yeah. And then we're waking our way down to the lower industrial uh, zone. This is um, a shingles plant. So there's room for three uh, covered hoppers here. And there's two car spots, one inside the building and one beyond for tankers, uh, the, the loading finished shingle products uh, yeah. in the building. And then to the right is um, a uh, furniture factory. I think I've got a view of it. Yeah. So this is an interesting build. Um, it looks familiar. I'm sure it's a Walters product, but I actually made it from two, um, uh, what do they call them, backdrop kits. And because I, oh. I, I wanted to hide this sharp corner, so I wrapped it around, you know, some distance away from the wall. 
So it makes it look like a very large building. But what you don't see is, you know, there isn't enough material in those kits to do all three sides or four sides of the building. So this back wall here is just sheet styrene. You just can't see it. Sure. So, so yeah, so this is a furniture factory. And then the rest of the buildings along the wall here are just uh, kind of backdrop uh, buildings. Again, these are from that same uh, cornerstone, cornerstone uh, modular kits from Walters, just built up what looked to be industrial flats. Gave them, you know, fill, filled in the, the, the brickwork with mortar. Um, looks looks aged. Um, eventually, come back, add more details. I've started some details. I've got, um, you know, recycling bins in. You know, I've got some stop signs and I've got some fire plugs in. So the, the details are, are starting to, to show up on the layout. It's a slow process. Those two different types of kits really matched up well right there. Yeah, yeah I thought so. I thought so. Um, this is the um, Armstrong, what do they call it? Armstrong tool and die or something from Walters. And you just basically just unwrap it. So from because they give you four sides, when you unwrap it, it's a very long flat. So it gives yeah, the impression. It's a huge industry. Just take oh, yeah. all four sides and put them against the wall. Yeah, that's a really good idea. You know, it, uh, yeah, you can't see it on that one. But yeah, it, it makes for a very long flat, which is kind of nice. Nice. So here we're into the um, the beginning of the um, lower industrial support yard. There's a switch uh, switch your yard switch tower yard office um, place to show off some some trucks. Uh, again, this isn't rail served. It's just something that that I think fit well to 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 camouflage the end of the tracks here for the mill. And in the foreground here we have the gas supply. So we get ammonia and LPG coming in here. These um, kits were one of my favorites to build. They are very, very delicate. I think they're GLX models. Um, they're um, laser cut wood, but like paper thin, right? Um, oh, wow. They are really, really cool kits. Um, and I built two of them. And this one you can see better. Uh, you can see the staircase in it, right? It's all see through. All wood. Really fabulous. Wow. Of course, this is just the, the Walters propane kit. I did the fencing myself uh, around. This is this is <coughs> fencing with piano wire, and the mesh was from some company in the Netherlands. I can't remember the name. Oh, it's metal. It's a metal etching. Oh, dang. Yeah. Um, See, Alan, this is uh this is one of those railroads. I think we could probably dedicate three or four episodes to. I think. <clears throat> so, um, there's, there's a view of the. Uh, of the grain mill this this is six walters kits and it's again just just put into a flat basically no no this is this is the actual no, it's the, the actual kit I didn't, it's against the wall yes at an angle but um i didn't cut them in half or anything it's huh. six actual kits and i doubled up on the, on the middle section here so sure for about 10 hopper cars here i don't know if you i don't know if you caught this but there's an oil tanker about to hit a propane truck that's not good <laughs> Yeah, um, there's a spot here for an extra locomotive to hang out to switch the um, the mill because with so many cars they often have midday switches, so um, we can simulate that. Got an yep. engineering concern here, um, and then we move down to the other end. So this has got a fairly large support yard because there's so many industries uh, in this area. Uh, there's a, there's a, a long main track through which eventually will extend beyond the wall. So you can come down here with you know 15 or 20 car transfers and and you're still okay right you can have a very long transfer this this um industry here is one of my favorites it was scratch built based on photos i took of um fraser brothers paper in thorold ontario it's reached by the pine street spur this that spur runs down the middle of pine street for a couple of kilometers and i again was fortunate enough to actually have the building diagrams the actual um building um, plans and the track diagrams from CN back when I used to work at CN I had access to that kind of stuff the only thing that I changed here is I added a second um, loading uh, track inside the building the reason I did that is because on the prototype there is actually one track that goes in the building and it's up on a grade but there's a second track that wraps around the building and goes into two more loading spots behind this building so 
I couldn't, I, you know, I was out of room here, so I figured I still want to have six loading spots. So there's three cars in each of these tracks. There's three cars in each of these two tracks. So it's quite a busy yeah. to switch. And Very the cool. Last, the last industry here, I don't know, two, last two industries. This is, um, uh, again, scratch belt. This is a, a um, refrigerated uh, warehouse. So you've got three car spots for uh, reefers coming in, and you can see the refrigerated trucks taking product out. And the last industry are these two tracks here. I, I, I couldn't um, uh, not have a bulk transfer facility. So I get plastic pellets coming in, occasionally cement cars, and any kind of liquid uh, bulk on this track here. Hmm. So. So the car. The car. Should we bring up the car here, Chris? Yep. Yes, yeah. please. Let's bring yeah. up the car. All right. Look at this beauty. Nice. <laughs> nice. So I saw a, a a question earlier. How does how does Chris choose his railroads? And one one of the main criteria is that you know there's somebody who's championing the railroad, and they they've got a social media presence, and they're 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 um, pushing their own branding to where there's there's people who will recognize it. And one thing I noticed about um, Sheldon's YouTube channel, um, just love the imaging on his locomotives, the branding on his locomotives. But I never did see any queue any freight cars anywhere. And now I know why he's filled up his layout to where he doesn't have room for any. But <laughs> one, of the, one of the neat one of the neat things about this project is Sheldon and I worked together to actually develop the first um, queue any freight car that was going to going to be rolling along out there. And um, not a whole lot of railroads have uh, freight car branding that matches their locomotives. And mm -hmm. uh, we started with another a number of concepts that were not. And, you know, it, it gravitated towards this, which is, in, in my mind, a, just, a, just a beautiful car. And looking at how Sheldon has had the um, locomotive shops and other facilities all in the same uh, scheme, you know, this, mm -hmm. this car is just going to fit right in. And with... Um, with the, um, uh, the, 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 the fan base it already has. I mean, how many people, you know, that, that are already on board with the CUNY are just going to love to have one of these cars rolling. I, I know I'm keeping at least one of each row number for myself <laughs> of all the road names. <laughs> but this, this is again, kind of like Brian's car. It's, it's a very complicated, uh, paint scheme, relatively speaking to freelance paint yourself, but, the folks at Rapido um, have got the, the striping all the way around the cars, the color separation, yeah. unique, unique logo. Um, it's it, it looks just right at home across the um, across the ribs on these cars. So we've got four numbers of this car and uh, they are selling. And it's got the silver roof as well. So that's another. Oh, that's another sweet. Color. That's sweet. Yeah. Mm, looks so, nice. Yeah, so we're we're pretty excited to to be able to you know take railroads that folks are able to see and uh, you know have already got people exciting excited about them and give them an opportunity to now I can actually have you know one of Sheldon's Sheldon's railroad represented on my own railroad you know and that's that's kind of what Home Shops is all about. Yeah, well, that was first of all. Thank, uh, thank you, um, Sheldon, for putting that presentation together. It really, it really is a, a, an awesome story behind the car, as well. And um, I think, I think um, there's definitely a lot more to unpack on your layout, like operations and stuff. So there Ooh, might have to be a to talk about there. Yeah, I, yeah, I, use I think homemade uh, Excel yeah. macro to create switchless. Yes, yeah, so I think we're gonna have to get into into a part two with uh you if you'd if you'd have us back so. yeah definitely yeah definitely yeah. sheldon you're up to uh 159 episodes on youtube now or what's your number uh, now 100, 149 plus a handful of uh local um rail fanning uh videos uh it's like not too far from the so, yeah. Yard. yeah i mean that's the beauty of, of social media and what we're doing you know if, if people are seeing this for the first time go to sheldon's um just search q and e railroad on youtube and um there is in-depth material that will inspire you on uh, 149 videos so it's there is a lot out there yeah. what i would also add is that if you look at the playlists on on um that i've created i've created a day in the life so when we have an operating yeah. session it, it takes you know like three hours three or four hours with three or four guys 
But me doing it by myself with a camera in one hand and the throttle in the other, it takes forever, but I, but I managed to do it. And it takes a series of 20 videos to capture a 24 hour, to simulate a 24 hour day and a day in the life of the operations. But if you want to wow. follow through on all the train movements, you can find those uh, on on the, uh, the website. Um, you can also find copies of the um, track plan. There are links on, on, on the home page to both the um, visible uh, layer and the staging track layer cool. on the front page of the uh, YouTube channel. Excellent. That's excellent. Well done. So that was still cool. Yeah, that was a good one. I, yeah, that was awesome. So we're going to uh, keep the, the train rolling here, so to speak. Um, we're um, just a couple minutes behind schedule. So we're on to our <laughs> next layout owner. Hey, we're doing good. <laughs> I, I think we can keep her under three hours tonight. I really do. I'm, I'm really hoping for that. All um, right. We have David uh, Colvin from the yep. Sioux Line Railroad and not your not your uh, grandpappy's Sioux Line either. This is something different, isn't it? Not the railroad I despise. Yeah, not, not the not railroad that. that Mike loves. Yeah, that I love. <laughs> love. I love the Sioux Line. Uh, yeah. That's yeah, right. Very good. Thank so, you, Andy. Yeah, why don't you take it away? Sure. The Sioux Line Railroad um, is happy to be a part of this group, really honored. And on behalf of the late Richard Kim, Chris, we thank you very much uh, for putting this car out there. I can't wait to see it. It's um, an honor. Yeah. The KC, uh, KCS has inspired the Sioux Line. Uh, it's sort of a bridge route in northwest Louisiana. Originally, when I first started operating, it was Texarkana to Shreveport. And in the last 15, 20 years, it became Shreveport to Alexandria as a bridge route with Shreveport having diverting lines that were represented by staging off to Memphis and Dallas area, and then in the south, Houston and New Orleans. I want to put a focus uh, today on why this car is so special, and it should be special for you. I'm going to get this started in the background. It's really because it's a legacy. And... Richard Kim has really left a big legacy for us all in this area uh, with the Sioux Line for over 40 years of operations. And my best guess, Andy, is that somewhere between 6,700 and 7,500 hours of operations have taken place on some version oh of the Sioux Line. Mm. Holy that man. That is insane. That's ridiculous. And when you're talking about the average 10 to 12 operators, we're talking about somewhere between 85,000 and 100,000 man hours of operations on the Sioux line. Mm. Um, he should have had articles in Model Railroad every three months, but uh, he never thought the railroad was good enough to be in there. And I just point out a few things again. Focusing on legacy and why a Sioux Line boxcar on your railroad is going to be important. If you remember back at the early days of uh, command control, CTC-16, this is the railroad it was prototyped on. No. We still have a couple of the, ori the original receivers and the original command stations from Keith Gutierrez. In the 80s, 70s, 80s, it was a linear design. Uh, no duck unders. And I'm going to pull up a picture or two here while I'm talking yeah. uh, about some of the other things that, uh, to me, just really stand out. Um, Let me see here. I'm looking for you here. Oh. As we do. But, I mean, you're, he's got the video playing in the background here, too. Yes. So that's really fun. Let me just, uh, once you get it up, let me know. Yeah, I'm just getting the first picture loaded so okay. hand laid track you know in 1991 i walk up the stairs in what i call sioux line version 4.0 and 91 only had publishing uh, articles magazines once or twice a month from a couple of folks and you see these layouts and you think oh i couldn't wait to see one of those and you walk up the stairs and there's the Sioux line. Can you see, see the screen can, now? Let me see if I can pull it up. Yes, I got it now. All right. That's not. Mm. Yes. Great. So the, the original is you're looking at Sioux line about 3 0. 
3.0. That was downstairs. Uh, he loved switching. He loved complex switching. And so if you'll look like this area called purgatory right there in the middle. <laughs> okay. I mean, it, was, it was not pleasant. Okay. Uh, computerized switch list in the late 70s, early 80s. Wow. Uh, just amazing. And then every one of the switches, uh, again, when I walked up, was motorized. So I walk upstairs as a 21, 22-year-old kid at the time and see this great railroad. This, again, is down on the uh, original downstairs. Uh, that's Richard. Uh, some of these engines and cars are still running today. Uh, made it in the magazine regarding uh, CTC-16. And again, one of the very first panels that he built and did all the technology for. Uh, but that wasn't good enough. So upstairs that we went and uh, they were getting everything ready. And unfortunately, when the roof was off, what was going to be that railroad taken upstairs in August in Louisiana, where it's bone dry and 104 degrees, it rained three inches one night and ruined everything. Uh, so they had to start over. And this is what was become Sioux Line version 6.0. Oh my gosh. Or, I'm sorry, 5.0. Um, again, walk up through there, linear design, fully CTC, was just a, a joy to operate. Uh, oh my some goodness. Other legacy parts about owning a Sioux Line boxcar from home shops. You got in here, if you'll, you won't be able to see it, obviously, but Cat Mountain in Santa Fe from David Barrow, one of his iterations is there. I was working underneath it this evening. Frank mm. Ellison, Lynn Westcott, uh, you name it. It's sort of a living museum of model railroading without all the cobwebs. Uh, <laughs> Welcome many groups across the region. We had Texas groups bring over people who they wanted to excite about operations. They'd bring them to the Sioux line and say, here's the gold standard. And so we'd have Saturday sessions and even broke some rules that were model railroading conventions, but that's for a, a different discussion at a different time. Um, Richard and Mose were able to take Sioux line operations and distill the fun and work of operations without it being, um, what do I say? Uh, just so focused on the realism that it wasn't fun. Okay. I mean, if you're having a really good mood one day and you want to ruin it, just ask a real road or how a real railroad or how their work day was, they'll get you out of that good mood in a hurry. Uh, <laughs> Mike? <laughs> They'll take care of that quick. Um, so again, Sioux Line uh, 5.0 oh, wow. was under construction. It involved pieces from Malcolm Furlow. Uh, oh my gosh. He built quite a bit of uh, the things and scenery on it. And then that was uh, just in the last three or four years. That's actually a night we had guests come over. And this is a small portion. It uh, in was uh, occupying a 40 by 48 foot space. Um, wow. You know, five printers, four laptops, three computers downstairs, just having fun. And there was this book. You probably Looks like you're using radios there, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the dispatcher's downstairs, and I dispatched about 96% of the time, and I'd put on my persona, and if I had a bad day, they all had a bad day. <laughs> 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 and then I was good at the end of the session. They, however, had a different attitude. Um, there was a book out there, How to Operate Your Model Railroad, right? Well, I always felt like we might should have written the sequel, How to Operate Your Model Railroad Weekly. Because this railroad has been operated weekly since the 70s. Oh, my gosh. Okay, and it's now in uh, version 6.0. Uh, I'm just going to flip through a couple of more pictures, and then we'll get to the unveiling oh. of the box car. Mm -hmm. This was one of the last projects before uh, Richard passed away, was uh, doing LED lighting throughout the whole railroad for daytime and nighttime op ops. And it turned out that the LED lighting in the day light was just as great as... Mm. Um, Oh, cool scrapyard. Yeah, I like what? that. <laughs> Here we are. Um, 
unfortunately, uh, mm -hmm. Richard passed away and we were able to still operate for two years there. And then the decision was made by uh, the Sue. <clears throat> it's a funny story. Richard married a Sue, got divorced and remarried somebody named Sue. So we didn't have to read a letter of the railroad. Um, <laughs> Sue line. This is the pieces we've saved and spared about 90% of the Sioux line. And you see it here being reassembled, uh, reimagined where Richard had CTC and spread out over 180 miles. We've compacted it down uh, for the next 40 years. You're going to see a different legacy of the Sioux line that's reflecting what he always wanted to do, which was a very large city industrial district. Nice. So it, the track plan now, if you can, is imagine is in a big X. Uh, but this is a, just scratching on the surface. We've already done some updates since this picture and look forward to sharing uh, the Sioux line for the next 40 years with the people across the country. So I'm now interested to see what Chris has to show. Mm -hmm. dun, dun, that Ooh. looks awesome. Wow, nice. That's really cool. Chris, you want to comment or anything on oh, the call? Can you hear me now? I had it on mute. My apologies. Yeah. Thanks for that. Double secret mute. Yeah. We're uh, just extremely excited to have the Sioux line. And I'm really glad we're doing this show because I've, I've watched as um, I've uh, posted that these cars are available in a few places over the last weeks. There's a lot of interest, but a lot of, a lot of, you know, where did this railroad come from? And as we're as we're talking to these, these these people, they've been around for quite a time, and they've got some legacy to it. Um, my my dad was a member of the KCSHS, you know, and when I was a kid, we would often end up in Shreveport for conventions, and as part of that was a visit to the Sioux Line Railroad. So I, I was exposed to this railroad at a very young age. Um, yeah, the Sioux Line car, the colors, David uh, and some of the other folks there. Um, helped us uh, match the uh, red that was used. Uh, these decals, uh, we had uh, an older set of decals scanned, uh, so because there was not a, a vector file for for um, the artwork in existence when we did the project. So now we've got that. And uh, just uh, just a lot of fun. It's available in four car numbers. Um, David, there is a, was there some significance to the car numbers um, that, that you guys picked? Uh, if I told you I just kind of pulled them out of thin air, would you believe me? No, I think it had something to do with dates, I think, but um, yeah. <laughs> relevant to this point. 23021, 23024, and the 124 and the 148. But it's just the fun of these projects. And, you know, you showed that picture of uh, the four boxcars in the beginning. Mm -hmm. we, we we feel like this car um, – put in the Sioux Line train or any other railroad, uh, for folks who have seen the Sioux Line, they're going to look at that and think, I know exactly what this is, you know, and that's, that's part of what this is, uh, what this is about. Also, uh, just a little bit of a higher view. It's got the silver roof, just a gorgeous car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not just a play on that uh, uh, Northern Sioux Line railroad. The, you know, the, the name is very del deliberate for, for personal reasons. And, and as David said, you know, you, you want to have a railroad, run it like a railroad, but you also want to have fun. And uh, the, the folks at the Sioux Line always made it, made it fun. And it's really exciting for me, you know, rest in peace, Dr. Cam. Uh, you know, a lot of times events like that are the end of legacy railroads like this. And to, to see folks that have banded together, continued operating, and moved it, and they're going to move forward with it, uh, it's just it's just an honor to to be able to be associated with with a group of people like that. So we love having a Sioux Line car in the Home Shops family. Mm -hmm. I remember why I remember seeing pictures of that railroad when I was growing up. Yeah, the, you know, and I'm I'm 53, yeah. so I mean, this thing's been around for a long time, like a long, long time. Yeah, really, has. really cool. Very cool. Yeah, I think it turned out very well. And uh, it's, again, aside from everything else, I think it's very humbling and very um, an honorable uh, thing just to do for Richard and his memory. He would be very proud of the result uh, that's displayed there. That's awesome. Well, David, thank you. When I, you know, I mean, when I reached out, you guys were just—it's it, awesome to work with. All the road owners were here, but uh, this is the 
uh, I'm thrilled to be able to bring yeah. bring this and, car to the market. And that car weathering on that car looks fantastic. It's a that scheme weathers very well. Yeah, awesome. Very good, David. Thank you for uh, bringing the the Sioux line to all of us, and especially our viewership for those who don't know a little bit about the history. The you know that is behind that railroad it's very important to where our hobby is today so thank you for for sharing that sure, thank you. Really cool all right so we are on to let's see here next on the list of home shops fun is the superior transfer jim abbott yeah good evening thanks for uh first and foremost waiting i know we're getting long in the tooth here but um Jim, you, you also are um, uh, uh, one of our hobby vendors as well, correct? Yes. Um, I, I own and operate Highball Graphics, a uh, decal company that I started back in 98 and uh, still going strong. Thank you, Jim, by the way. Oh, you're welcome, Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> you remember 12 years ago, 3, 8, and half, oh, yeah, three and a half by 11 feet? Yeah, thanks, Jim. It's been a number of years, but thank you. And Sam Meehan, I've done his decals in the past. So, yeah. Yeah. So but, let's uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, well Superior Transfer uh, originally started in, in 2002. My wife and I took a trip up to the Twin Ports in Duluth Superior, and we just fell in love with the area. Mm hmm and it's like trains everywhere so i was like huh this could make it beautiful then it's like you know there's too many different railroads here let's make a different one so <laughs> superior transfer came about uh the concept is from uh, uh the, well actually the original name came from the superior terminal and transfer that used to, it was a terminal railroad in Duluth Superior. And uh, they run, the concept of the railroad, they run from um, Winnipeg, Manitoba, to Chicago, Illinois, over mm -hmm. former um, DWP and Sioux Line trackage. Mm -hmm. And um, runs on trackage rights on uh, the Sprague and um, so the, the Sprague and the Fort Francis to Fort Francis area and then uh, the DWP on the rainy, rainy sub to Superior and you know so on down to Chicago and oh, wow. they run let's see they, they operate two main yards which is uh, the Pekegama Yard in Superior, which is CN's current yard, and which they operate as a transfer yard to different railroads in the area. And the South Yard is in, it would be Kelly Yard in Chicago, which I named, is a, it's a fiction, fictional yard, which I named after my, my friend Kelly Duford. Uh, who originally painted my first two locomotives for the superior transfer. Hmm. So oh, that's anyway. a cool caboose. Mm -hmm. Yep. I like the caboose. Yeah. This caboose was painted by Mark Roach in Ruthven, Ontario. I had him paint a couple of cabooses for me. And let's see what else is on here. Oh yeah. These are uh, oh, preci cool. precision scale. Um, Pulp wood cars or uh, log cars, actually. Oh, nice! Wow. Yep. That's my first <laughs> transfer box car that I did back quite a few years ago. That's a Intermountain Pullman Standard. These cars here were done by John Bazine uh, down in Florida. Your model works and uh, see what else we've got here for pictures. Yeah, let's see. 
Um, so Joe Bohannon, that that's real clever. Who does Jim's decals really? <laughs> 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 that there is an O scale Atlas MP15. <laughs> that was that's good. Yeah, that's Dog good. Industrial models over in Maine did that for me. Wow, that's sharp looking. Oh, yeah. we have that's here. slick this looking. I like that photo shoot that I did down on Mike Confalone's Allagash Railroad, which uh, he only lives about an hour and a half from me. Why does everybody get to go there but you and me, Andy? Well, it's just you. <laughs> it's definitely worth checking out if you're in the area. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get to that part of the country very often. So, <laughs> but look at that. That's beautiful. Yeah. Love that the chevrons. Cool. Yeah. So, and I took my paint scheme basically from its a combination of Chicago Northwestern and the chevrons, a sort of CP area, even though they go both directions. But, um, I wanted something that would stand out and and still look a little different. Um, so I use Chicago Northwestern yellow and green. Um, same with the box cars. Yeah, just a very interesting offer from from Ralph Ranzetti here. Um, if any of the guys are interested, I'll weather one box car. All I need you to do is pay for shipping. So I'm mm. assuming I'm assuming that Ralph is referring to um, the folks on the show this evening. So um, why don't you contact Ralph Renzetti um, over there, hashtag not sponsored, and <laughs> uh, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. So, so, so the, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so this is the car. Oh. Yeah. That's sharp looking. Nice. Dang. This is the car. Mm. So, you know, I've interacted with Jim for in, in different ways over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. He's, he's done some decal sets for me as well. And, you know, it's always just been Jim Abbott, you know, highball graphics. I didn't know him um, personally. And then I got to working on that uh, Allagash car uh, that we did in the, the Tangent 4427. And Jim was uh, involved in that process. In fact, the artwork um, that is on that car and the artwork that is on this car, uh, all the vector files for it were, were created by Jim, of course, because that's his wheelhouse and he's very good at what he does. But in the conversations that I was having with Jim about the Allagash car, it came up, oh, I've got my own freelance railroad. And I said, what? <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about that. And he sent me some pictures, some of the pictures that you saw and, and some of the other ones. And I thought, well, why does Jim get to keep this a secret? Because this is really cool. So uh, I, I thought, you know, when, when cars come along, I'm going to reach out to him because there's just something about the way he presents this, that, that Superior Transfer logo, mm -hmm. the colors, his own Cushion Express design, and the locomotives. When you see that, I think everybody who saw those thought, this this is this is really good looking. This is something that is is believable. So I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, Jim agreed to let us uh, add the superior transfer to the, the home shops family. And this is the first car. I, I have a feeling there's going to be more, um, but it's, it's got the, the very unique superior transfer logo. It's got the, uh, the, the CNW colors that he specified for his road, uh, all the, all the details. And uh, it's just, it's just a gorgeous car. And uh, Ralph, I'd love to see one of these ones weathered by you i think it would look fantastic yeah that would look really cool the mm. green and yellow mm -hmm. mm, i love it jim this is super cool um i did put um a, a link for uh highball graphics down in the show notes tonight as well um and then you have you have decals for your road out there as well um yeah. available for sale correct yes i do i have uh few different sets um the boxcar set for the yeah, 50 foot paper track and yeah. my uh, 53 foot dry vans um there'll be more to come i just haven't uh i've been so busy with other stuff i haven't had a chance to get to any more yet but um, That's how I, it goes. I understand that 
pretty exclusive line of freelance de- decals on my website uh, for different railroads. And um, Hank Stevens from Georgia Road, uh, he he did a lot of artwork early on in the early two, 2010 and on. Um, he really filled out my freelance selection with, with his offerings. And uh, his concepts are just second to none what i've seen and uh just a few other owners and uh that i've that i've dealt with have been very very gracious on letting me add their their cars to my line and uh yeah. hopefully we'll have more in the future yeah that's yeah, uh yeah i look forward to see what else you guys come out with for the freelance line for sure so jim thank you for um taking the time to to be with us and, and staying with us here uh while we're we're um coming into the to the final um final grouping of mm-hmm. our railroads this evening so yeah. um one of the i guess the producers of the show tonight uh, uh chris um has his own road in this in this uh, series as well, don't you? Do you want to come off a double secret mute and uh, give us a, a little, uh, a little um, uh, backstory on the the TGNN? Yeah, if you uh, if you want, I'll do the reverse of everybody and I'll start with the car um, that came out when I when I started tackling this Rapido project and looked at these other cars, I thought. I just love this car, the, the B70, and uh, I've got my own uh, freelance Meridian Speedway. I've got a website, meridianspeedway.net, a uh, pretty developed concept. And uh, I, the, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, I, I just, I can't not do this car. And um, so we, we, we've, we, uh, I've taken the liberty of adding the Texas and Great Northern to this, um, this run. Uh, it's in what we call Tedder Green, named after Mr. Russell Tedder, who uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, coming up. Uh, he was the, the the president of all of Georgia Pacific Short Lines, which is kind of part of the inspiration for my Meridian Speedway story and how I uh, turned it into a freelance application. So this car is also available in four road numbers, the same details. Uh, it's got one of the door selections that's unique with just the three um, the, the three fork lift grooves instead of the four on that door type. Uh, but, you know, one of the difficult things about modeling uh, your own car and decaling is large circle decals over ribs. You just don't, it's hard to make it look like a perfect circle. And uh, to, I, so for that reason, I've shied away from decaling cars like this myself. And uh, just the, the opportunity to have this done at this quality, uh, it's, it's exciting. So. I don't know. I may keep all of them for myself. I'm not sure, but they're up for sale right now. <laughs> you can't. You can't do that. No, I. I called dibs at least on one <laughs> in I'll the make pre-order. Sure, right? No kidding. <laughs> I'll make sure you get one. And um, I've I've shared the Meridian Speedway story several places before, but I'm gonna run through a file real quick here. Sure. Uh, just uh, um, let me close down gems here. Um, just to familiarize everybody with it. Yeah, and right now we got hashtag not sponsored running behind me right now is the home shops local here. Um, so all of the previous runs um, we have up and running on the Mascoutin Valley tonight. So take a look at that. You'll see that coming through every now and then. And we'll kick it over to Chris here. So I've got, uh, you know, I've, we, we've talked about some of my early introductions to the freelance railroading and model railroading in New Orleans and Louisiana. Um, things, um, life moves on. I moved to Texas. I took on a professional career, uh, moved away from the model railroading. Before then, I was always a prototype modeler. Um, and I decided about 15 years into my career, I wanted to get back into the hobby. And I decided to create a freelance model railroad the, with, with my version of the Meridian Speedway. And I've got, this is the homepage of the website, meridianspeedway.net. Feel free to peruse the pages there and check it out. Um, not a high-tech map, but essentially the inspiration for this railroad, you know, I grew up in New Orleans, not a very prosperous part of the country. 
in the 80s, we watched a lot of decline of, of railroads in the Illinois Central from Meridian to Jackson uh, through Vicksburg. Um, was not in the best of shape, you know, one or two trains a day. It got sold off to a, a regional uh, known as Mid-South. And um, from there, the KCS took it over and turned this railroad that was almost, you know, on the, the, the verge of extinction into what it is uh, today. And now it's uh, the Canadian Pacific. But that story of, to me, a, a town that doesn't have a railroad is a sad town. <laughs> you know, if I'm traveling yeah. somewhere and a town doesn't have a railroad going through it, I really don't find like I want to be there very long, you know. And what it symbolized for me to watch this this revitalization of this railroad was, was hope in that story. And I, I wanted to incorporate that into the um, Meridian Speedway. Also, mm -hmm. part of my experiences young were as a member of the Southeast Louisiana chapter of the NRHS, we had fan trips on a lot of different railroads. And there was one railroad group in particular that always welcomed us. And that was uh, the, the Georgia Pacific and their um, freelance, uh, their, their short line railroads, the Ashley Drew and Northern, the Fort Ice and Princeton. There's a picture of a very young me on the right. I don't know. That must be... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a very long time ago, uh, but on a G GP28 with a few other folks um, on one of those trips. You know, when you when you do this summer after summer, you 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 um, I, I got an affinity for that railroad and that concept. So when I decided to go freelancing, I thought I'm going to go reach into my history and pull all of the aspects of things that really impressed me, that made me feel good, and I'm going to put that into my freelance concept. So. Um, this is just kind of a stage shot of an, a bunch of my equipment, um, but you, you can definitely see the influence um, of the Ashley Drew and Northern. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, you'll hear terms proto-freelance. Um, I'm going to focus this just a little bit on prototype. This is Vicksburg, Mississippi, which is the, the center of where um, I intend to build a model railroad of my version of the Meridian Speedway. This is early mid-south you can see a lot of structures that are long gone old power track not in the best of conditions but it it was it was a really neat place it just spoke to the history of what was there and you could see that this could go one of two ways either it would not um survive or it would and along comes this mid-south brand new creation bought some secondhand power uh and uh, these uh, this scrappy group of railroaders put together uh, a plan to save a railroad that otherwise was was not going to exist. And it was just fun to watch. Here's a photo I took. You know, you, you would visit Vicksburg and it would just be this cove. The Mississippi River is behind me. There's bluffs on the other side of the tracks. And there were all these 567 prime mover Jeeps just idling away there. And it was just, it was like going to Jurassic Park for me. <laughs> you know, here's all these dinosaurs that should not exist and, and they're there. And they railroaded with them. You know, this is the famous hill in Vicksburg um, and uh, uh, coming out of a tunnel. You can't see the tunnel because the Jeep 10s were exhausting quite a bit of, of, of fumes. So that piece of railroad was the inspiration for the geography and the routing of what is my freelance and in my experiences on the um, the Georgia Pacific roads with these fan trips, were my inspiration for the image. You know, it just they. Wow! Did he stop? Did he freeze up on us? Yeah. Oh my God! He's locked right tight. <laughs> oh oh wow. no! Oh man! And did everyone else freeze up on me too? No, I don't think so. No, I'm good. Just Chris. Nope. That's Chris. Poor Chris. Oh, oh man. Oh man. Uh, I'll send him a message quick. That's awesome. He just he just went right into the freeze. Ah. Uh, yeah, there wasn't even a glitchy part or anything. Nope, but hey, look nope. at that picture though. That is a sweet yeah. looking picture of a pair of GP twenty eights. And that's yeah, one of your that's one of your cool. favorites, isn't it? Yes. I'm so jealous that he got the do that. I, I, I sent him a note there, Andy. Okay, very good. Um, but that was a great picture to freeze on, yeah. right? I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful locomotive. 
uh set coming in i think he just dropped from from the screen so we're going to try and get him back um oh, he, hey andy he says go on to the next guest he has to reboot all right well the that's a that is a sad <laughs> Thank you, day for, for taking care of that yeah yeah not a so, problem oh, man that's how we roll you know, that's <laughs> right just just keep it moving on down the line right roger, so roger that so um well, we'll we'll catch up with Chris in a little bit, but um, one of my favorite uh, freelance railroads that we're going to kick off here is with Robert Welke and the Wisconsin and Upper Michigan. And um, I, th- Bob, if you'd be so kind as to to give uh, yourself a, a little introduction while I bring up the pictures that we sent out, and yeah. then we'll. What's that? No, I can't first bring them up first. Yeah, here we go. I can't wait for this one. Yeah, yes, yeah. All right, take it away. Well, the Wisconsin and Upper Michigan has been my freelance rare now for close to 40 years. Um, wow, my career in the railroad industry started off on a major carrier and then I went to short lines, but. The majority of my career was as an operating officer on the Wisconsin and Southern. So my interest in railroading really is a regional type carrier. And early in my rail fan career, a couple friends of mine uh, took me up to Marquette, Michigan. And driving across the Upper Peninsula, you barely saw any trains, but all of a sudden you come to the area around Marquette, and there was trains everywhere, all these ore trains, Lake Superior mm. for me, Chicago and Northwestern, uh, Sioux Line, and this, this little 20-mile area was just busier than busy with trains. You couldn't even shoot them all because there were so many of them running up there. So that always intrigued me. And... When I got to model railroading, of course, I'm one of those people that was influenced by greatly by um, Alan McClellan. Yep. Uh, when I saw what the Virginia and Ohio was, that's what I wanted to have. And uh, so I started trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And originally, the WNUM was going to be uh, the Chicago Northwestern from Green Bay up to the Ishpeming. And I was going to call it the Wisconsin and Michigan. Hmm. However, I was involved at the railroad club up in Wausau. And there was a fellow there by the name of Lyle Beck, who introduced me to a friend of his by the name of Dave Rickaby. And they were modeling the Wisconsin. <laughs> yep. 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 So I scrambled and I um, tried to come up with a name. One of my friends suggested uh, we call uh, jokingly we call it the Wisconsin and Upper Michigan Peninsula Railway because whenever he uh, had a he had an HON three layout and the engines would stall and he would say give the table a wump. Um, so the <laughs> would do a P and I'm like no that that isn't going to fly. So it became the Wisconsin and Upper Michigan, and eventually it became a matter of I. Um, realize that the Northwestern line, there just wasn't enough traffic up that way to really pique my interest. And all of a sudden, one day it dawned on me that the old Duluth South Shore and Atlantic, if we just pretended that in the Depression era, instead of the Canadian Pacific gaining control, it became a regional carrier and was able to survive into the modern era uh, it could be a good overhead traffic railroad with some iron ore business on it yeah so the wnum as you see there on the picture was born running basically between superior sault st marie and st ignace um, i model the area around marquette that allows me to operate northwestern uh, ls and i and a little bit of Yuskanab and Lake Superior. And I set the railroad in the fall of 1982. And the reason it's in the fall of 1982 was because 
In the summer of 82, the Northwestern transferred all of its remaining ALCOs to Green Bay to operate on the ore lines. And that winter, when the ore traffic slowed down, uh, a number of the oddball units that the Northwestern had were uh, retired. And I wanted to have some of those oddball units, so the fall of 82 became the setting for the railroad. Nice. So Andy and uh, Mike have both had a chance to operate on my railroad. It's a single level railroad, which has bugged me for years because I really wanted a, a double level railroad, but <laughs> I'd never operated on one and I was scared I wouldn't get enough people to operate on it. Mm. And then I became a member of the River Rail Group over in La Crosse. And suddenly I've had more than enough people <laughs> to run the railroad. Yeah. And uh, yeah. my 12 man roster is basically filled up two, three months in advance. So we're now considering very seriously that the railroad that I'll present probably has only got about five months to live. Um, what? What? Yeah, the River Rail Group has its biannual national meet um, in June, and I'm about 98% committed to tearing the railroad down and doing what I've always wanted to do as a double deck railroad. Hmm. So, you want to go to the next picture, Andy? Yeah, you betcha. You bet. I'll put my glasses on here. Um, as I said, the railroad set in the fall. Um, here you see an LS and I door drag that's passing one of our locals uh, in the town of Nagani. A um, little bit of color in the hills. If you've ever been to the Upper Peninsula in the fall, the, the colors are extremely vibrant up there. So I'm trying to capture that as best I can. Uh, next picture. All right. This is Partridge Siding Staging. Um, the LS and I and Northwestern, uh, there's a six track yard down here that is the main staging yard for all those trains that come on and off the railroad. Excuse me. But as you can see, uh, the variety of paint schemes and locomotives. I'm a big Alco fanatic. Um, so there's lots and lots of Alcos on the railroad. Next picture. Um, this is the Marquette Roundhouse. Marquette is the main yard and main shops of the railroad. As you can see, the engines um, are basically in the old DSS and A colors. They're not exactly, I didn't follow it precisely, but I followed it close enough that you could see the heritage, but yet not really. Um, it's not really the DSS and A scheme. It was uh, some of my own. Next one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is when Andy and uh, Mike were overrunning. I'm like, oh my god, what have I done? <laughs> yeah, that was that was that was where the greasy meat hands band was formed in your basement. That, I right. think. <laughs> After when we had beans, you can see the ore dock. Um, my ore dock's nine foot long and uh, it holds about 28 cars on each track of the dock. It's a full four track dock. Next. So I got a question about the ore dock. Has anyone ever pushed cars off the end of it? No, surprisingly they have not. Okay. I was worried I was going to be the first one. <laughs> Wait till the next time we're over. <laughs> no, we're, I've asked already. We're not invited back. Oh, dog. <laughs> you guys can come back sometime. I'll have to have you guys over for one of the last sessions here. Um, yeah. Another one of our switching jobs is uh, the Nagani Turn. Very popular. Takes about half the session to complete. Um, here's an RMS 11. Uh, switching Nagani. Uh, Nagani was kind of an interesting town because in 63, the Northwestern, the Sioux Line, and the LSNI uh, built an entirely new great separated railroad uh, between a little place out in the woods called Diamond Junction. And 
the Euclid yard, which was constructed if, as part of the project. And as you can see, the cars in the background are up on the main line, which is up on top of the hill. But in Nagani, there were a couple of these spots where the main line had a little duck down and they would hook up with a section that they could serve a couple of customers. So I had to have that on the railroad. So the next session, next picture. Oh yeah. This That's is a, a meet shot. out in Martin's Landing. Ellis and I were a train passing a WNUM freight on the side. Kind of like that shot. It was unplanned, but it came out really well, I thought. Yeah. Next one. Uh, we have the BN run through train. Uh, we uh, fantasize that the, there's enough BN traffic that we actually have a run through from Superior to Marquette. So you'll see a couple of green and black locomotives down the on the railroad passing one of the hills on the, by Nagani. Next one. Whoops, I went too far. Oh, you went too far. Uh, I have a branch line that goes down to Republic. And as part of the branch line, uh, the ENLS actually had track to Republic, although as far as I know, they never actually got up all that way. Six Milwaukee road trackage, but I had to have an excuse to have ENLS Baldwins on it. So they come <laughs> in with a couple of cars, do some switching and go back into the, in the staging. Um, the, this job is one of them that I have a gopher job which a lot of people like. And it's called the gopher job because you go for this train, you go for that train, you run about <laughs> eight different trains during the session. Uh, none of them take a real long time, but you get to run something on air, on pretty much everybody's railroad. So next. Yeah. Uh, this is Euclid Yard. Um, you can see we do ore changing here. That was the main reason between Euclid was that uh, in the rationalization in 63, certain railroads served certain mines and then everything would come into Euclid and get sorted out to go to the either the dock in Marquette or the um, Northwestern or the LSNI. Um, so we do the same thing here at Euclid, plus there's a couple locals that operate out of here. Uh, the lead engine there, the 512, is in the simplified paint scheme. Being that I'm an 82 and the W and UM portions were never really, really good, um, we just figured out that there would be some sort of an economy kick there, so we simplified the paint scheme a bit. Yeah. And I think it works pretty good. Yeah. Next. And, of course, the dock and the ore boat. Um, the ore boat is totally the creation of my son, Matthew, who uh, I'll give a plug for him because he's another decal manufacturer. If you've ever heard of Circus City decals and graphics. Um, I bought a Sylvan boat from a friend of mine and I messed around with it. But the Sylvan kit is basically for the boats as they were originally constructed. And after World War II, almost all of the boats were modernized with new pilot houses and new stacks. And I found an article that told how to build those. And I talked to my son, and he's into 3D printing as well. And I asked him if he could just uh, print out a stack and print out the pilot house for me. And he said, yeah. Well, as he was doing that, he posted pictures of what he was doing. And a fellow from uh, Interlake happened to contact him and says, well, he says, this isn't quite right, and that's not quite right. And they got <laughs> talked back and forth, and he goes, well, I can get you plans for that stuff. No. So oh. Here came the pilot house, and then, we, of course, he says, well, you got to have a bridge crane. And then he noted that there's, I think, I think it's 48 um, clamps that hold down the hatch covers. Right. So started doing this and started doing that and all of a sudden this project just kind of took on a whole life of its own and so it's an interlake boat but the really funny thing about it was I was talking to him one day and he was acting kind of strange and he goes 
have you been down and worked on the railroad lately? And I go, well, yeah, I was just down there an hour or so ago. Have you looked at the ore dock? <laughs> oh, I don't pay any attention for the ore dock. And this is right behind my workbench on the other side of the aisle from the dock is my workbench. And he says, you really should look at the dock, Dad. So I go <laughs> down there, and here he brought the boat over and parked it there. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. So he did just an outstanding <laughs> job. Of yeah. I don't take any credit for it whatsoever. But next. I like that view, drone view down on the dock. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, once in a while I do something with good. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next one, if there is. We're yeah, back at Euclid Yard at the engine terminal. Like I say, I try to model the railroad as a as a regional that's doing okay, but they're not super super wealthy or anything on it so you know it's 82 we've still got a bunch of old alcos and f units running around and getting their last mile to run out of them but i think the concept works pretty good next one oh well this will segue uh, into what uh oh just uh oh <laughs> um i was sitting home one day and the telephone rang and this guy introduced himself as Greg McComas from Fort Worth, Texas. And he said, she has been working with my son on making decals for his railroad. And he, my Matthew suggested he talk to me because our railroads kind of paralleled each other rather well. And, of course, my first thing is, okay, what am I getting myself into here? But as we talked, we... Uh, suddenly began realizing that our ideas on how model railroad needs to be operated, our timelines, our stories really, really dovetailed very well. Um, the Michigan Interstate operated up to St. Ignace and the WNUM would, have, was looking, would have to be looking for a better partner for overhead traffic. And Greg pretty much needed an overhead traffic partner to go west. So one thing led to another, and we kind of started figuring out that our two railroads would eventually have come together down their way. So Greg models current day. Like I say, I'm stuck in 82. So it's given both of us uh, a lot of enjoyment because I've been able to make some Modern day W and UM equipment, and Greg has been able to do some older Michigan interstate equipment. And I tease him all immensely about our hostile takeover of us, but <laughs> it's been quite friendly and it, it makes enormous sense uh, in, the, in the scheme of things there because both Greg and I operate our railroads with the idea of it had to fit into the real world as what would have happened. Hmm. And yeah. that gives a lot of credibility to both operations mm -hmm. on there. And like I say, we would have been left stranded. And especially once the Wisconsin Central started up, um, it would have been tough on us to, to exist because they would have pretty much taken away all, everything out of Sault Ste. Marie uh, traffic there and taking over the Algoma Central and, uh, you know, the CP traffic. And we, of course, have to fantasize that the uh, cross barge traffic across the straits um, was able to exist longer than it did because actually the Chief Wawatam, which was the ferry that went across the straits, that had service ended in 84. But we fantasize that it'd be, it was continued on as a barge tug combination on the um, operation. Yeah, so, like I say, it just all kind of fit really, really well together, and it's been a ton of fun yeah. doing it. So, I think that's the last slide I had, wasn't it? Or I think so, yeah. Yeah, so should we pull up the car then, Bob? Yep, and pull up the car. All right, Chris, come off a double secret mute. He's back with us. We'll have to have him on again to talk about the rest mm. of his heritage, but let's take a look at this Wisconsin and Upper Michigan car. 
Well, there it is. Uh, it's uh, exactly to the specs that Bob wanted. Uh, yep. I think we, we, we matched the green uh, exactly with the paint chip uh, that we sent overseas. And uh, looks another real. another complicated logo to get over ribs. Um, but it's just Bob had sent us a number of photos of, of WNUM box cars and uh, that he had already painted. And it just uh, it, it just seemed like a perfect car for for this car type. So when I reached out to Bob, he agreed that this was a, a good fit. Did you have uh, anything you wanted to talk about the kind of service this car would be in in your era? Well, in our era, they would be lumber cars, basically, mm -hmm. um, either working finished wood products out of a couple of warehouser plants or f flooring. There was actually a very large flooring manufacturer in Lake Linden that shipped out boxcars of flooring. So um, we fantasize that we got 50 cars on the secondhand market to bolster the 50 FMC cars that were already on the roster. It, it's fit in really, really well with, uh, the, with the railroad and the numbering, and Chris was great to work with. Um, and then, like I said, I sent a lot of pictures and uh, like Greg, I'm kind of particular about my brand of my railroad there. I want everything to uh, be correct. So it came out really, really well. So sharp really car. Yeah. Yeah, it came yeah. out really nice. I really yeah, liked it. looked good. Doors. This was a lot of fun to put together. And, you you know, Matt was able to provide us with the vector files for the proprietary Wisconsin and upper Michigan marking. So it, it, it's, it, it matched the playbook perfectly. Yep. Yeah, this is it's another one that's in my pre-order. I think I got a couple of yep. them coming. I got one they're, for sure. <clears throat> they're going to look good working Pine River wood products behind yep. me here. So, yeah, very excited to see these coming out. Me too. Can't wait to see them in person. Mm -hmm. McComas, should be seeing him soon. McComas has been sending me all kinds of pictures on his railroad. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, I guess, a nice little little segue. Um, we do have uh, Greg McComas here, the uh, new, um, I guess, the hostile takeover um, <laughs> champion of the the Michigan Interstate with us. Uh, welcome and thanks for. For joining us this evening um we're gonna have you uh just uh kind of carry on bob's story here um i don't um i think and then um you're also a hobby vendor as well aren't you that's correct yes so why don't you uh give a give a introduction here to the the second section podcast uh crew here on uh, who you are what you do and then uh let's talk about the the michigan interstate Sure, sure. So, uh, Greg McComas. So, first off, the owner of MacRail LLC. So, doing the uh, modern detail parts and uh, PTC antennas, solar panel systems, and some highway loads now. Uh, and I've been doing that for about three years, kind of the part time. Uh, also, working transportation for the full time, but uh, really kind of sticking back to the railroad here. You know, I'm also the owner of the Michigan Interstate uh, Railroad. Uh, and that's been around since. Um, this current iteration here in, in North Texas uh, was built in the fall of 2012. So it's about 11 years old, double deck in an office. And that's a whole nother uh, story for another day because we can get off on a different tangent there. But, um, you know, really the Michigan Interstate is a class two modern freelance regional. Uh, it has its roots start out in the early 80s uh, and kind of before the 80s to kind of help with that backstory. It was really a conglomeration of, of small short line or small um, independent systems and also subsidiaries of like Penn Central, New York Central to kind of give it credence to fitting into the actual networks uh, in lower Michigan. Uh, I myself grew up in the Detroit area. So the Grand mm. Trunk, the Grand Trunk, the CSX still with Chessy schemes, uh, very much imprinted on me as a kid, spent a lot of time in Plymouth, down Detroit uh down river at flat rock so and i grew up under the under the noodle right and that's that's been a big piece of it also as a kid i saw michigan railroads and michigan industry really fall on hard times a lot of rationalization a lot of abandonment and so as i got to build the michigan interstate i wanted to say what is my way to kind of rewrite that story a little bit and be a little bit more prosperous 
uh, for the railroad industry, and of course, even also just the industry in general in Michigan and how it can be serviced by railroads. And I'm able to kind of uh, channel that creative freedom uh, through the Michigan interstate. So, yeah. And so here's your, you have a nice Facebook page yeah. uh, dedicated to your railroad here and just some really cool pictures. Um, and you've, you've had a couple of cars come out as well for uh, home shops prior to uh, this run, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Actually, yeah, I went in this picture here, you can see uh, one of them, the first cars in the ambassador fleet that Chris did was the uh, Michigan Interstate 4750 uh, in the 9100 series it is. And so that's a, it was kind of a real ubiquitous scheme. Um, you know, we got a lot of those cars uh, during the kind of the attrition from Conrail over. So we picked up a lot of cars that way. And then, of course, they all got repainted in the, in the late 90s. Oops. So, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah, so you'll have to check out what he's got going on in his page. And here you go. So here's – this is a, a nice little uh, segue then. So um, – how, the 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 hostile takeover um is there is there more to it than meets the eye because i saw on bob's map that there was a connection looked like uh by saint ignis there yes. um, on the on the eastern side of the railway where it looks like there was some i guess uh collusion already happening between your two roads <laughs> Yeah, there was already, you know, so in, in 82, there was already three lines from the south that were connecting at St. Ignis. And, of course, fast forward to now or to the modern day, Michigan Interstate was the one that really survived through the rationalizations. Um, and that was really through the partnership with the Wisconsin Upper Michigan. And so, mm -hmm. like a lot of mergers and acquisitions and, and joint ventures, what started out was really as uh, good interchange, solid interchange partner turned into haulage rights right so michigan interstate get into like marquette or tour towards superior under like a haulage agreement which a lot of modern carriers do same thing with the wisconsin upper michigan into this you know down toward detroit so allowing each carrier to have a little bit larger reach um hmm. which then turn into you know more partnership equipment pooling um and then ultimately in really in 2019 i was kind of going back before the show to look at uh, when we really started doing it and started in 2019, we actually started doing some equipment pooling uh, between carriers as kind of a, a joint venture, if you will. Uh, yeah. And then 2020, April of April of uh, yeah, April 2019, we started doing equipment venture in April of 2020. We actually uh, uh, the merger happened, essentially. And so that's where we are now is you have Wisconsin, Upper Michigan kind of in the Michigan interstate kind of blending identities, right? So there's, there's a kind of a standard guys corporate scheme. We can kind of see it here in the pictures where we adopted the, the Michigan interstate scheme. However, uh, the Wisconsin upper Michigan identity is very important as well with their brand and that logo. So it's kind of a Janice of Wyoming where it's, there's some standardization to it, but there's also keeping the flair of what is Wisconsin upper Michigan. Uh, in Michigan interstate. So they're, but they're blended now and like on the railroad, you'll see a mixture of, you know, some Michigan uh, interstate cars, Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin, upper Michigan cars and vice versa. Some care reporting marks of the other carrier as they get kind of blended across. So it's uh it's pretty neat, uh, pretty neat story. It's a real go slow approach. So it's when you come to the layout and as you, as, as modelers and operators come to operate here, They'll, they see, okay, maybe last time there was maybe one or two less pop, motive power, a couple extra cars. And every time you see a little bit more of a blend or maybe you see a car is now a combined scheme. And so it's a very subtle go slow approach uh, as the two carriers kind of now are, are really under one umbrella in transportation. Yeah. Can, can yeah. we expect, can we expect at one point a family lines type of uh, paint scheme down the line somewhere? I definitely think a, a heritage scheme, uh, you know, going back to what Bob had in 82, that neat uh, red, green, and, and red stripe. I think we definitely are going to see a heritage scheme here in the future. Um, that would be for, awesome. As for a corporatized uh, family line scheme, I'm not sure about that. Um, we kind of, I have some other uh, pictures and pieces. I always tease Bob about, you know, fully removing the, you know, Wisconsin Upper Michigan identity. It's more of a joke as we go back and forth. But uh, this is where we kind of landed as as a compromise because it's important. You know, as myself, as a modeler, 
you know, my own freelance, it's important that, you know, Bob has given me a lot of creative freedom in the modern day to work with. It's also important that I honor uh, his wishes and, and work with his concept to making sure that, you know, we're carrying that, that brand forward, right. Into the modern. Right. So it's, it's a back and forth of, Hey, Bob, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? Right. So even though it, it was a hostile takeover, if you want to call it, uh, there's, there's, <laughs> there's still a lot of creative input that the, uh, you know, the behind the scenes, you know, really the shadow operator is, uh, is kind of pulling the strings. So, <laughs> So I got I have a question uh, is uh, going back to Bob here. So you you're talking about doing a new layout. Are you gonna are you gonna do this version of the Wisconsin and Upper Michigan? Or are you still gonna hold eighty two? Well, no, I'll stay in eighty two, and I'm actually not going to model much more than what I have. the The concept would be. Um, I would just spread everything out so that there's more distance between towns. And you've been to my place. My eyes yeah. are kind of tight. The older I get, the more I dislike that drop uh, bridge that I have. Um, you know, the new design would be a walk-in. No, there's no lift out, no drop bridge. Right. A bit wider. It just really flows really, really nicely. And, one of the things that is pushing me this time is the other guys in the river rail group have a lot of them have committed to helping me rebuild. So it won't be a lone wolf effort this time around. Yeah. And a couple one of the fellas is going to move in with me, he said for a week and get the railroad all set up for the CTC and signal system on it. Oh, wow. Um, so that'll be CTC right from the get-go. And the other thing that they keep pushing on me is the fact that, um, you know, I already have the engines, I already have the cars, I already have the buildings. All they basically am going to do is build a whole new stage for it to operate on. Yeah. And the goal will be it'll come down. And within 18 months, we will be back in operation. Is anything going to survive, like maybe the paper mill? Um, not really. Um, okay. The, okay. The paper, the paper mill is going to survive to the degree that it will still be there, and some of the structural work that I've done will be there, but it's probably going to end up being a little bit larger and a little bit different configuration than what it is now so nice yeah nice. that's a fun job to work mill job's a good job the guys fight over that so yeah so then greg just to kind of circle back to you you're gonna be at springfield as well correct that's correct yes uh chris yeah. and i'll actually be both uh, side by side in the young building uh right near the food court and if you're looking for uh, I guess at White River, White River Productions, excuse me, they are next to me. So we're right there in kind of a line uh, in the Young Building, right in front of the food court. Oh, that's awesome. Perfect. Very good. So, well, thanks for uh, coming uh, on uh, this evening, talk about uh, the, the Michigan Interstate and the hostile takeover that is the uh, Wisconsin and, and Upper Michigan, formerly known, or the artist formerly known as the Wisconsin and Upper Michigan. So, um, we're going to move on here um, to our last but certainly not least uh, railroad here, the Wyoming Valley and Western. Sam is the most patient person on the planet um, waiting through. Sam is, Sam is probably thinking you should have named it the Atlantic Valley and Western. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for hanging out there, brother. I yeah, appreciate thanks. it. Of course. Of course. Yeah. No, it was, it was great getting to see everybody's uh, stories here. It was fantastic. I enjoyed every second of it. So, Sam, so, why don't um, go ahead? Let me, just, let me just queue up my pictures here, make sure okay. uh, that's good. But so, I created the Wyoming Valley and Western back when I was 14 years old. Um, wow. That was in 2012. And I started off just drafting up a couple logos in Microsoft Paint on the computer. And I would print them out, cut them out. Uh, and stick them to like Bachman and Ather and Blue Box stuff with scotch tape. And um, 
I really didn't have any experience with like model building per se, for like kit bashing, any painting. So through this railroad, I began to sort of experiment with that. Um, and not long after that, I joined the Hudson Model Railroad Club. It was about a month and a half after that. And that was pretty much the place where the WV and W grew up. Um, let me see if I can pull up a picture here. Navigate the ye old screen share of doom. Yeah. See if I can find you here. I do appreciate you all hanging on here. This has been a real fun episode getting all of these road owners on at one time here. It's uh it's pretty cool. Let's see. Okay. So I'll just I guess I'll start here. Okay. Flip over to here. So this is our layout here, the Hudson Model Railroad okay. Club. It's a two thousand square foot display. Roughly. I'm gonna are you sharing a picture? Because I see a video. Um Oops. Uh, let me just let me so that way I don't have the uh, TV, the million dollar t or the million TVs in one effect. Oh, okay, here. so I screwed it up then. No, that's all right. Out. It's all right. So. But. Do, 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 do. Let's see. It doesn't seem to like that. I think I'm sharing the picture that he. Uh, was wanting to share there. Is this, this one? Oh, wow. Ah, yes, that's it. All right. Yeah. So that is, uh, that's our display here at the Hudson Model Railroad Club. Um, it's about 2,000 square feet. It is, uh, it's a beautiful layout. We, we take good care of it here. It, it's been here since 1982. Um, oh, wow. And since in, in my time at the, at the club, which is about 11 years now, we've, uh, pretty much, touched every aspect of scenery on the layout in some way, shape, or form in order to update it. We try to add new industries, things to kind of keep it interesting uh, for the public as well, because we do host open houses in the winter. But so um, as far as the WV and W is concerned, this is where um, I really got to be introduced with like the serious side of model railroading. Um, mm. DCC, super detailing, weathering, painting. Um, there was a lot of a lot of that going on, um, and I really got to kickstart this from fellow members as well because I got to uh, experience some other freelance railroads that were um, being ran by other members, and this is where I kind of was like, huh? So it's kind of not such a dumb idea. Like maybe I should take this a little bit further. Yeah. And then over the years, I just began to, through trial and error, get better at painting, detailing, decaling, weathering, and stuff. And um, that leads us to the WVW of today. And then I'll get into the story now. Um, you can find, I think I sent the map picture. <laughs> oh, so yeah. so uh, here we have the system map. And um, the story begins um, with the Pocono Northeast Railroad, which those that are familiar with the area was a short line in the wilkes -Barre area that handled, or basically acquired a lot of the former Conrail tracks of what was left in the wilkes -Barre area. Um, by the, by the mid-late 70s, most of the rail traffic and, and tracks had been torn up and, and the traffic left. But... Um, this short line operated throughout the area from the early 80s until 1992 when it was for sale. And in 1992, a holding company decided to purchase all the assets of the Pocono Northeast and operate it as a new identity, uh, like a short line, to basically serve the remaining customers in the area and do their best to try to encourage more rail service to come about. Um, so the WVW operated a pretty successful short line in the, in the mid nineties. By about 1996, CP, which was operating the DNH at the time, uh, the DNH wasn't performing well enough for them. Uh, they 
opted to focus on their Midwestern presence with their acquisitions of the Sioux line, et cetera. And um, the WW began to pick up the slack a little bit for CP as CP was contracting them to serve a lot of the area customers that were once served by CP. Oh. So this was done through trackage rights and you, uh, what you name it. But it was decided that the CP would be giving up the DNH altogether. And the WVW seemed like a great candidate to take it over, considering the relationship that was established and the operations that were currently taking place. So it was settled the WVW would be expanding to um, acquire the DNH and kind of create itself as in a new identity as more of a competitor in the Northeast. <clears throat> At this time as well, the Conrail split was getting near and um, Norfolk Southern was kind of going over their route miles that they would be acquiring. And um, they decided to offer up the Buffalo line and a few other industry branch lines in the area to increase competition in the area for themselves. Um, so by 2001, you have the system map that you see here. And this includes all DNH trackage rights as well um, to through Allentown to Newark, down to Philadelphia, across okay. the Buffalo as well. And that's pretty much where we le it leads us now. Um, I model the WV and W currently in um, the years 2010, 2011. Okay. Which uh, leads to some interesting power acquisitions over the years. And I, if you could flip through uh, some of the photos. Um, yeah, you so got a really cool paint scheme. Looks kind yeah, of briskly. Uh, the colors that I came up with were actually inspired by the Wisconsin Southern and <laughs> the TV and Q. So it was just a great – I really fell in love with those two colors together, and I decided to kind of try to make it a little bit of my own. Yeah. Kind of looks like the old Colorado and Wyoming Railroad paint scheme too. And the, uh, the, the pride of the fleet is the SD40-2 on the WVW. It's, it's the, uh, the favorite. There's 25 of them on the roster. Oh, my this gosh. Is, this is because wow. of growing up next to the CP DNH um, all the time. All we see is SD40-2s, and I grew very fond of them as a kid. So, um, of course, I had to represent them evenly in my freelance. And another thing I wanted to represent is – the a number of patched locomotives on the roster, as we see here. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to give it like a true, like not struggling regional, but not a very wealthy regional railroad. But you know, paint doesn't move freight is the mentality here. If, <laughs> if, it, right. if it runs, it's gonna try to make some money here. And um, that's while the paint scheme is real nice and they really like to doll the engines up a lot, we it's not a priority. No, that's and, cool. Um, I think I have a picture. Oh, no, I think that's on mine. Never mind. I did have a picture of some rolling stock, too, but I guess I can't get to that right now. But speaking of rolling stock, we can get into the home shops car. Yeah. This is cool. That is so cool. I got one of those on order already. Yeah, me too. So, <laughs> yep. I, I, Sam's uh, Wyoming Valley and Western came on my radar just from watching the um, Freelance Model Railroad Group. In the, he's actually got a lot of material on the Wyoming Valley and Western page. And if you if you search Wyoming Valley Western on the Freelance Model Railroad Facebook page, there is a lot of content and. All of his pictures, you know, when you're scrolling through your feed and, you know, there's this, there's that. Every time one of his photographs was in my feed, well, my, my, my thumb had stopped and I'm looking at it thinking, this is really cool. So right away, just, just the way he presented it, it the, the look, the feel, this, it just it, it said, hey, this is something a lot bigger than, than, than just a one-time photograph. It, it, it captivated me. So nicely done, Sam, especially... You know, you've been doing this as long as Greg's, I guess, had his uh, his Michigan Interstate now, right? About 2012. 
yeah, uh, 2012 is when I first started doing things. So, so he he's definitely been on my radar, and the product of our conversations is the first modern car ish of the, the the group here. It's got the conspicuity stripes. It's a little bit of a different paint scheme as it represents a repainted car. It's got the brown roof uh, instead of a silver roof by design. I think these are 2005 repaints or 1995. Yes. I forget yeah. off the top. And, and the story with these, these cars are uh, just general merchandise box cars. A lot of the, the traffic in the Wyoming Valley itself for the WVW is a lot of manufacturing. So it'd be supplies, raw materials, and then finished products leaving. So this would be a great car for anyone modeling any class one railroads in the 2000s to the present day, because uh, these cars would really end up all over the place, uh, just delivering things and, and acquiring materials. So I haven't told Sam this, but I model 1996, and I intend to just take the yellow stripes off of mine. I'm going to backdate them just a little bit because you can do that. Yep. <laughs> I, I want some Wyoming Valley Western cars rolling along the uh, Meridian Speedway for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's a really, it's a really cool uh, um, car that you guys have put together here. I am gonna, I am gonna just take over uh, for just a second because I did want to. Uh, showcase some of the stuff on Sam's uh, uh, Facebook page uh, real quick, if uh, if I may. Because yeah. um, there's some really good pictures um, on the Wyoming Valley and Western uh, Railway, and you get to see a lot of the power um, that he has out here. So, you know, just the, the, the modeling as well, too, right? So the, the, the paint scheme is beautiful but the the locomotives and the power shots and you know just the subtle weathering around the the skirting of the locomotive is or locomotives is is really good and um i think you know with the patch outs i think that also gives that that struggling class um regional type railroad uh you know a sense of realism for sure because i know you can even see the wisconsin southern you know, they still have patch out Union Pacific locomotives running around here. So, but definitely and, uh, check check this out. And look, there's a, there's a shout for Circus City, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> but if you can uh, pull up uh, one of the other pictures, it's of the, one of the things I want to show is the group that I have for the WV and W. Sure um, thing. Yeah, so I can bring that up as well. Yeah, so this is um, this is a group that I started. I kind of moved, I moved more towards the group setting versus the page, just because I think the group gets to a lot more people anymore. I think Facebook is starting to do some weird stuff, but um, it's also more personal. Like I love to share this stuff with with those who follow the railroad and like directly, and um, I share a lot of my build updates like you can if you join the group you can see the projects really from start to finish um like one of the most recent ones was the b40-8 that i just finished up i kind of oh yeah showed the in-depth build of that as well so if you if you'd like to see that's the this one here uh, is it like this that. one is this the one sam yes that's my most yeah. recent project i like that yeah this one this that's is the perfect. one that got my attention yeah I'm, I'm very grateful for the overwhelming amount of support that this railroad has gotten over the years and leading up to now and i'm extremely humbled to be here and grateful for this opportunity i never thought in a million years that it would get to this point but here we are and i i don't intend on slowing down anytime soon so well, yeah. it's a it's a privilege to have you on board, and you know this this whole community of model railroaders, young. Some of us have been around for a while. Um, it's just it's it's a hobby that's open to everybody, and really thrilled to have 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 someone. <laughs> it makes me feel old <laughs> doing such wonderful work because it you know it, it paints the picture that this hobby is around to stay. Uh, so yeah, keep that up. Yeah, so that's. It's fantastic. That's very cool, and, Sam. Yeah, thank you for for being patient and and sticking with us. And I'm glad we could share some of the work 
uh, with you here. So um, that's going to put us essentially down uh, the whole list of, of guest roads this evening. Yep. Um, we are just a teensy bit behind schedule, but that's okay. We're going to go into our wrap up here. So um, I just wanted to give a chance for uh, Chris and Doug um, and, and, and Jeff to talk about and, and Greg to talk about Amherst um, and, and what they're going to uh, be doing here in the in the near future um, and then uh, what we'll do is we'll we'll give them a chance to wrap up here and then we'll we'll shut her down for tonight and tie up so um, we'll pass it over to uh, Doug and Chris first of all thank you for uh, again coming on the show and putting together this fantastic cast of characters and uh, railroads that's for sure um, but I guess uh, so. So we've we've got this one out. When when can we get these cars in our hot little hands? Well, um, on the pre-sale page, I'm advertising. We'll ship them in February. There's maybe a little upside to that, but you know, I, we've got uh, we've got Amherst coming in, and by the time we get back from that, you know, I've got to label the boxes and, and sort the inventory. So I'm I'm hoping to start shipping them in. Uh, uh, when I get back from Amherst and uh, there is a possibility we'll have some at Amherst if we can uh, mm. the logistics of that. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Yes. So make, so make sure you get your pre-orders in so they don't all get pilfered up at Amherst this year. That's a good word. Pilfered. Yeah. Pilfered. <laughs> Cause otherwise so, Chris is going to take all those TG and N cars and, and keep them for TN. <laughs> And I'm, I'm thinking about pulling them down right now. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but you know, thanks to Jeff and the the Rapido team, um, you know, this car, even though it's an SP prototype ish, is um, I got to see the undeck version of it in, in a prototype phase at uh, I think the Denver show last year, and it caught my eye as this is a great 50 foot box car that has all kinds of applications for many, many freelance railroads. And I think uh, Greg and I were talking about this yesterday. When you look at the painted models, it doesn't scream this is an SP car. And part of what uh, I, the, the, the value that the freelance um, niche has to the model manufacturers is with great model railroads like what Sam has done and Brian has done, you know, everybody has done the, the tooling, the costs that go into making a car like this that has limited prototype runway available, um, you know, we, we can add that kind of volume. And I'd, I'd like to think that this niche is going to gonna allow manufacturers to, to bring more cars that don't have a whole yeah. lot of runway on the prototype side because this is a beautiful yeah. car. And uh, yeah. Jeff, That's I don't really think... Good point. Jeff, I don't think we mentioned it, but this was kind of your baby, I think, at the Rapido. It's, it's, this car has got your thumbprint on it, correct? <laughs> I mean, it, it does in a sense. I did take it over from someone at a, an earlier stage, but um, it was a fun one to work on and to get some input on. Um, and honestly, for me, I think we're really hoping to get them to you to have them at um, Springfield Amherst because it would just be cool to walk around the corner wherever your table's at see them all out for real <laughs> yeah know, out there to see and have everyone browsing there um so that, that's a hope and certainly there's some other and future freight cars that are possible for more custom treatment like this some interesting ideas yeah um, very cool yes this is uh this has been a great evening and um from my perspective uh, a great blend of uh, historic roads that have been around as well as the the, the newer roads, uh, great work there, Sam. Uh, as as a uh, old transportation dog, as I identify myself, it's neat. It's neat to see the younger generation and the uh, creativity. Um, and that's one of the things I was thinking about here in, in listening to the stories and then looking at these beautiful cars. Jeff, thanks for uh, what you're doing with the Rapido team. To me, this underlines the individual creativity of the railroad owners, and these cars underline that creativity. So it, it's. Uh, quite a, a, a cool community here. Uh, I'm excited about getting back up to Amherst. Um, going to have a different role uh, this year. Uh, going to be excited about that and the looking forward to having these cars. So uh, uh, Andy and, and Mike, thanks very much for putting this together. And uh, yeah, it's been a great evening. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
one final comment too. We um, we have a newsletter going out in just a couple of days, and these will definitely be in them. <laughs> so nice. see more about them there too. Cool. Uh, that'd be awesome. Very Look, excited and, to get my hands on these finally. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So that's that's fantastic. And so we'll be looking for, I guess, some some updates from Amherst. Greg, you're going to be there as well with the full booth of good stuff uh, right next to Chris. Um, and make sure that he doesn't uh, sell all the cars that I bought <laughs> yeah, um, <please. laughs> out from underneath me. Um, it's a but, clown show. It's an absolute clown show with us. <laughs> what, what is, I've never been to Amherst. What's it like? No. Is it, is oh, man, you, you, wow. you, you gotta, you gotta come. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I've been going with a group from the Philadelphia area uh, fairly mm -hmm. regularly. I've only missed a couple of the shows. I started going to it in 1998. Um, and to, to watch how it has evolved. One of the years that we were there, they always give the attendance figures on Sunday. One of the years we were there, and I can't remember what year it was, but there was 22,000 people through that show in two days. That's insane. Um, and I, and I looked nuts. at my buddies at dinner that night. I said, are you kidding me? Um, but yeah, it, 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 it's amazing. I, it, in my opinion, it's the best show uh, because we've watched it evolve. Uh, my buddies and I, we've watched it evolve into a show where in addition to it being retail it's also a trade show because manufacturers are there i mean they've got they've got a focused audience so they're they're gathering all kinds of intelligence mm -hmm. folks use this as a platform to make announcements um you know people go hey yeah what time's the announcement going to be you know so it's oh, yeah, right. and it's you know andy yeah. if you if you and and uh, you guys can get up there sometime uh do yourself a favor and get there yeah. that's like in a week and a half right is it Oh, not, guys, oh now hold on there because that's the we're still working hard. Uh, I think it's like two weeks out. Oh, Is that two weeks? Yeah. Oh, oh my God. sorry, yeah, Greg. I didn't, I didn't mean to give you a yeah, I was gonna say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two weeks from two weeks from Friday. Uh, yeah, oh man, so you guys will be packing your bags pretty quick here to get up there, that's for sure. Yeah, our stuff mobilizes kind of like you know, Chris and I being in Texas, we have to ship our stuff in advance, right? So we'll ship it the week before kind of advance to the hotel and then we fly in that thursday and it's my son comes on he's 11 this year he's this will be a second year it's it's a it's a wild it's a non-stop from we hit the ground thursday till we leave monday it's just go 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 um you know friday set up saturday uh, that's still christmas thunder here but we walked in last time and we had we had our breakfast sandwiches in our hands from stopping at dunkin donuts along the way we didn't finish eating them because we had a line at our boots before mm -hmm. we even opened, and we did not. No. We, did not we, we did not finish our. We did not finish our breakfast until about eleven thirty. Mm -hmm. It was that busy. Wow, not, non -stop, that's insane. Non -stop. Yeah, we we'll have like sometimes 30, 40 people at our table. And it's very silly. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's, 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 it's a ton of people. It's great because you get to meet you get to meet the modelers. I mean, that's like I said, it's, it's the relationships, it's the meeting the people. I mean, yeah, yeah, we're we're making good sales, but it's also about meeting the people who are using the products, getting that that direct feedback, get that relationship. You cannot replace that with anything. That in the that in person is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sam stopped by uh, our our booth last year, and uh, you know, just just being able oh, to meet yeah. and interact, even though there's a swarm of people, it it means a lot. So you know, it's yeah. be there again. Looking forward yeah. to it. Feel yeah. free to bring that B40 to sit on the table to display if you want. Yeah. Um, hey, that's a good idea. Yeah. And you laugh, but, you know, Chris was selling my cars. We had the Ambassador Fleet. Was That was the first time he had the Ambassador Fleet for sale. And he's like, you know, that guy sitting next to me here, that's, that's the owner of that railroad. It is. And so I got, you know, a Sharpie marker. And I started literally signing cars. Hey, you know, I just can't believe <laughs> this. I mean, what a value, what a value add. I mean, that's that was a free free signature, and I had never done my. It's terrible. It's a terrible signature, but you know, it was great to meet people. Like, hey, I love your railroad. I follow it. I had no idea you were here next to it. So, it's a it's a great way to connect across. And Chris has done such a great job with that uh, that vehicle, right? With that freelance vehicle to uh, to connect us all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chris, no, you can't a, sell the B40 on me if I bring it up. <laughs> Just don't for touch. display. Don't touch. If oh, you do, fantastic. I want at least at least 50%. <laughs> <laughs> 
we'll get your B40 back to you. But I think, you know, <laughs> to have it, you know, on display with the with the new box cars will just, you know, help people paint the picture. Because a lot of people have seen, you know, your locomotives, but they may not make the association right away that what they're seeing on Facebook is this car, you know. So right. I'd love to have that, put that display together on the table. Yeah, of course, very yeah. cool. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on Amherst as the crew uh, from from the show this evening makes their way uh, up there in a couple of weeks. Um, it'll be interesting. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to happen and all all the good stuff. So, Mike, I got to ask you: it's time for the awkward part of the show. Right I know. Before we, what do you think of this one? My head hurts. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, yeah. That's a lot. That's information overload and a half. I tell yes. you what, that beautiful layouts, guys, beautiful paint yeah. schemes, amazing modeling. It doesn't matter. I mean, we have every age bracket in here. We have every skill set in here. Right. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much for you know for coming on and uh, sure. being, you know from Rapido there and Chris and and. Doug and Greg, you know, thank you guys for everything you guys have been doing. And as and as Andy and I, I don't want to speak for Andy, but I mean, as a freelance modeler myself, the one thing, Chris, that you've been doing is you've really put freelance modeling on the map. Yeah. And and I tell you what, it is it is really refreshing to see the stuff that you come out with and and uh it's really cool to see the story and to hear the story of all these layouts because yeah. there have been some of these I've never heard of before. And now I'm like, oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. cool. You know, that's really sharp. And and I'm kind of a paint scheme junkie. I I you know, I <laughs> I just can't yeah, the old man was a paint scheme junkie. Yeah, he was a paint <laughs> scheme Christmas junkie. Story. <laughs> but I mean honestly it's it's you know, thank you for everything. Uh, great night. Uh, everybody did a great job. Well, yeah. it's it's greatly appreciated, and I do want to reciprocate that thanks because, you know, this this, this isn't possible without having, you know, guys like you uh, offering this platform where we can get the word out. So it's, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, everybody from the road owners to the manufacturers to the, you know, uh, podcasters uh, who, who get the word out and the people who are posting 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 very important it every one of those pizzas is just as vitally important to make this work to where these cars move and we can reinvest into more projects so uh, we, yeah. thank you very much andy and mike for what you guys are doing yeah well it it's, takes uh, a village yeah, yeah it certainly yeah, does it's absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah this is definitely our uh our pleasure to put this on and and mike and i and i'll, I'll speak for him here as we wrap up but I think it's, you know, I think we just absolutely love doing it. So maybe not. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course we do. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Uh, so we're just going to do a little bit of admin here. So um, great show tonight. I think our peak was 150 in the chat. And we stay, stay in that for at least a couple of hours. Make sure that you guys are checking out Home Shops. Um, for your pre-orders on these, you don't want to miss out on these cars. They're going to go fast. Um, and and the, especially with knowing the stories behind the roads, make sure you get um, get out and, and order yours today. They are running at a discount right now. I think they're five bucks off uh, for pre-order. So that's a pretty good screaming deal mm -hmm. that you want to take advantage of here. Um and then, of course, check out Rapido if you want to go and see what the, the SP and the cotton belt looked like. And, of course, we had uh, Jim Abbott and Greg here from MacRail. Um, check out their stuff, too. They got some really cool uh, products that you're going to want to uh, start using in your hobby as well. So um, one little note, we're toying with doing a Saturday show um, this week here. We're going to have... I think uh, it's rumored that we're going to talk to Luke Lemons, uh, maybe William Sampson, uh, as we shift from the from the freelance into the prototype. So uh, we're going to go and dive dive headfirst in into the prototype uh, world. So that's going to be interesting. So bringing back the Sioux line, but different colors this time. So 
Anyways, so I want to thank everyone here in the sec uh, in the second section section crew this evening. Uh, fantastic uh, conversation in the chat, and we will hopefully see you on Saturday. And if we don't, you will be seeing us on the twenty third, which is my birthday. So happy birthday show coming to you live here from Ripon, Wisconsin. So you guys take care, have a good night, and we'll see you. Saturday. Thanks. Bye. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs>